Professor Stefania Giannini, Minister of the University Education and Research, Mrs. Sara Ferrari, Provincial Minister, Mr. Xavier Ramonet, General Director of DG Education and Culture, authorities, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to welcome you uh, to, uh, here at the University of Trento to the Conference of Empowerment of Next Generation of Researchers, Promoting Talents, Spreading Excellence, jointly organized by the Italian Ministry of Education, University and Research, in collaboration with the Autonomous Province of Trento. We are very proud to host an international conference uh, with such high purpose to reason about uh, the pr prospects of uh, uh, European young researcher to discuss about uh, an opportunity the, um, uh, that have but also to the obstacles that they find in focusing the building of an efficient European research lab of market a process that could be deeply contributed to the economic upturn and in the development of an innovation-oriented research system in Europe. Member states, universities and research organizations can do much also to make research careers more attractive through a fair recognition of academic diplomas with open, transparent and merit-based recruitment procedure and by promoting gen gender e equality and specific programs to foster young researchers across borders. There are still much to do to develop a business mobility between industry and academia, with uh, only one in six researchers in the university having experience in the private sector in Europe. The University of Trento believes in research across border mobility and mobility towards industry, being aware that Marie Curie grants are those that at most aim at fostering young research mobility. The University of Trento has focused its effort on that particular grant by recruiting incoming and outgoing young researchers with high potential and excellence curricula. Within the seven framework program, our university has won a total 218 projects, of which 59 founded by under Marie Curie Action, covering the whole range from individual fellowship to ITN, IAPP, IRSES, and Researcher Night. Such a policy in research and recruitment has given its fruits. Today, the University of Trento is the leader of the Italian medium universities as far as, quali as quality of research concern, according to the uh, report of uh, the Italian Agency for Research Evaluation. Moreover, Trento is one of the few universities ranking in the, in the Time SI education ranking in the brackets 251-275 and, <coughs> and, and among the first 420 universities in the classification drawn up by the most recent QS World University ranking. The University of Trento results appealing to local and foreign researchers also become uh, its part in the Trentino research system and through live in laboratory on a large scale. I hope uh, that your attendance to this conference will be frightful and I wish you a pleasant stay in Trento. I would like to express a special thank also to the European Commission for the organization of this event. Thank you. Now, the next speaker will be the uh, minister, provincial minister, Sara Ferrari, on the behalf of the, pro the autonomous pro province of Trento.
Non si sente. Ora sì? Sì, grazie. È con grande piacere che partecipo all'apertura dei lavori di questa conferenza, inserita nell'ambito delle iniziative della Presidenza Italiana del Consiglio dell'Unione Europea e delle azioni Marie Curie della Commissione Europea. Ringrazio ancora il Ministro Giannini per aver scelto di collaborare con la nostra provincia nell'organizzazione di questo evento e anche il Direttore Generale per l'Educazione e la Cultura, Dottor Monnet. Ringrazio voi tutti per aver scelto di venire a Trento a discutere sui temi della mobilità dei ricercatori, che è mobilità internazionale, ma anche mobilità tra ricerca e industria e quindi trasferimento di conoscenze tra contesti diversi. La provincia autonoma di Trento è stata la prima a ricevere un finanziamento europeo con l'azione CoFound Marie Curie, che ha portato nel nostro territorio ben 89 progetti finanziati fra il 2009 e il 2013. Anche in questa legislatura il Trentino sta investendo molto sull'apertura internazionale dei ragazzi, della ricerca, delle aziende e della società in generale. Stiamo lavorando per un plurilinguismo funzionale e quindi calato nella vita quotidiana di tutti i nostri cittadini. Stiamo partendo nella realizzazione di questo obiettivo dalle scuole di ogni ordine e grado. Crediamo in tutte le esperienze di mobilità internazionale dei giovani, quali momenti di arricchimento culturale, interculturale, oltre che linguistico. La capacità di innovazione, quindi di crescita e competitività economica, grazie alla ricerca, è al centro ancora oggi della nostra attenzione. In questi anni abbiamo investito nella ricerca e nell'alta formazione. Abbiamo qui a Trento un'ottima università, due fondazioni di ricerca la cui attività è riconosciuta a livello internazionale, oltre che sedi di altre importanti realtà di ricerca nazionale e internazionali. I nostri centri hanno una buona massa critica nelle aree legate all'ambiente, alla scienza dei materiali, all'informatica, alla genomica, alle biotecnologie e alle neuroscienze. Godono di notevole prestigio anche i settori umanistici. Ricordiamo inoltre che Trento è sede del nodo italiano degli ICT Labs dell'Istituto Europeo di Tecnologia. Stiamo ora lavorando per avvicinare maggiormente la ricerca alle nostre imprese e quindi con piacere in questi due giorni ascolteremo il confronto su temi quali la preparazione dei ricercatori per una carriera multisettoriale in linea con i bisogni dell'economia e della società, il contributo dei giovani ricercatori al trasferimento di conoscenze, le esperienze internazionali dei ricercatori anche in contesti produttivi. Colgo l'occasione per ringraziare anche gli studenti della Scuola di Alta Formazione prof Professionale dell'Istituto Pavoniano Artigianelli che hanno realizzato il logo e la corporate della conferenza. Ringrazio tutti i partecipanti. Non voglio ora rubarvi altro tempo. Auguro a tutti noi che da questo meeting possano derivare spunti e idee utili per l'agenda europea. Mi permetto anche di ringraziare tutti i funzionari della Commissione europea, del Ministero e della Provincia che hanno reso possibile questo importante appuntamento. Auguro quindi buona e proficua prosecuzione dei lavori. Grazie. Grazie a lei. I invite now Javier uh, um, Pramonet to deliver its welcome speech. Uh, Good morning, uh, uh, Onorevole Ministro Giannini, Rettore, uh, Assessore Ferrari, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, good morning. You know, the, the, the easy part of my 10 minutes is to tell you about the good things that Marie Scolosa Curie program does. Uh, for this, you don't need actually a speech from a Commission official. You just need to see uh, the three awards that we'll be handing out this morning and the 15 uh, shortlisted projects, and there you'll see Uh, a young scientist who has had the intelligence of sparkling the interest of Dublin commuters for physics by using the example of Enrico Fermi to calculate the number of leaves that fall on Dublin uh, in an autumn. Uh, just, just to show that, uh, like another uh, Irish, famous Irishman said, education is about sparkling a fire, not filling a bucket. And you'll see a very young lady who has taken up 
genomics and archaeology together to look at a skeleton of a 24,000-year-old young boy from Siberia to understand better the population of the Americas by human beings. And you'll see a brilliant scientist that has given a lot of her time to tell young women in Europe that they also can do science. Because, as you know, we live in societies in Europe where we have equal rights for men and women, but women are not told often enough they can be as intelligent, as innovative, as scientific as men, actually more so than men, if you look at statistics about education outcomes. Uh, so, yes, uh, spending money on Marie Skolovska Curie is a very good way to spend public funds. I can actually not think of very many good, better ways to spend public money than this way. But let me say a few words about something perhaps more difficult, but just as real, which is the challenges of Marie Skolovska Curie. And I can think of three very serious challenges we should look at together. The first is a word that I'm sure is very familiar to any of you who are practitioners of our program, and this is the complexity of our administration. Now, this is, this is sometimes overstated because nobody should be able to spend 6 billion euros, certainly not 6 billion euros of public money in a very, very easy way. Public money must be spent well, but also in an accountable way. And in a way, the cumbersomeness, the Soviet cumbersomeness of our procedures is compensated by the North Korean stability of our budget. We fight for a budget every seven years, and then we have a lot of peace to try to understand what the budget is for. But certainly complexity is a problem because we are certainly discouraging many talented young men and women from applying and benefiting from our programs just because of the fog of our procedures that stand between them and Marie Skolovska Curie. So that's one challenge. Another one which is more complex and more difficult in my view is summed up in one word which is oversubscription. We have seven times as many applicants to Marie Skolovska Curie than we can fund. And this would be a problem anyway, but it is certainly a very serious problem when we see, as we do see, that a huge majority of the projects we don't fund are actually extremely good. So we have the frustration of many applicants who spend a lot of time, a lot of energy to produce very good ideas, and then we don't help them. We create frustration, and more importantly, we don't exploit the potential of an ecosystem of innovators that we have in Europe. This is really, really a real problem, and we should try to see what we can do with our member states, with research institutions, to make better use of the select, if only of the selection process in which applicants for our programs do. But then we come to what I think is the real challenge we have, because indeed we will help 65,000 fellows in seven years. We'll support 25,000 PhDs. That is great, but it's a drop in the sea compared to the needs. And the challenge, the real challenge for Marie Skolovska Curie is to make sure that that drop is actually the right drop. And the right drop means something, in my view, really critically important, which is linked to a very simple fact in which I very strongly believe, which is the nature of innovation and technology, the way in which we interact with science, with innovation, with actually learning and teaching, is changing dramatically. And the future will be for those institutions, for those individuals who understand that change. The real task for Marie Skodowska Curie is to help master, harness that change, rather than be a victim of that. And let me say just a few words about what I mean with this. You know, we've known for a long time that uh, the purpose of learning is to make man a better person. Actually, literally man, huh? and because until about a century ago, for most societies, women were actually not worthy of an education. So it was about men. Now we know that it's about human beings, but we also have understood not just that innovation, learning is good for the individual, but also it's good for society because creativity creates productivity and growth. But also, maybe more importantly, we are, tr we are seeing now that it is not the transmission of knowledge. It's not even the invention of technology which takes our societies forward. It's actually the way in which knowledge is shared in increasingly complex networks under very unstable environments. Now, if you look at a research and higher education institution, from that perspective, you'll see that they're not very good, with many good exceptions, they're not very good at handling complexity, complex networks, and especially changing environments. Most higher education departments are actually department-based, discipline-organized, and therefore not really 
not really having the right administrative, institutional, economic incentives to look at innovation as we should, which is not to make sure that more people study STEM, not to make sure that more people study humanities, but to make sure that humanities and STEM are both excellent and work together. This is the sort of inventiveness, innovation we should promote through the program. And, and this will be my last words. The trick for us, the way in which the Commission, as I see it, will fulfill its most noble task is not by telling people, institutions or countries what to do, but to help find out what works and scale it up. This is what Marie Skolowska Curie can do. And this is how we can solve the problem of the drop in the sea. Not by being just good for the direct beneficiaries of our programs, but to make sure that we have systemic impact by finding out better ways to innovate, better ways for knowledge, better ways for teaching and learning. This is the secret of exploiting the potential of Marie Skolowska Curie. And this is more importantly the secret of making sure that our research institutions don't focus just on excellence as measured by peers, but by impact on society. And I really think, I hope you'll agree with me, that the potential impact of research institutions, of researchers, of innovators on society, in Europe in particular, is grossly underexploited. This is a common challenge, because this is where the future of Europe rests in its human capital. And if there is a difference between Europe and the rest of the world, is not the crisis. Most of the world have bigger inequalities than we do have. It's not the crisis of the welfare state. Most countries in the world don't have a crisis in the welfare state because they don't have a welfare state in the first place. The difference between Europe and the rest of the world is that we don't have enough confidence in our own future. And I am completely convinced that the main reason for that is that we have lost the belief in the transformational power of knowledge, of education, of teaching, of learning. This is what Marie Skodowska Curie is built for, and this is what we together can make Marie Skodowska Curie about. So for this, what you can count on is on the relentless cooperation of us in the Commission who are not functionaries, we are civil servants. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for your words. So now the Minister Giannini, please. Thank you. Dear Acting Rector, dear Minister Ferrari, dear Director General, dear friends, if I can say so, I'm really very happy and honored to take part to this uh, international conference dedicated to research and researchers. And I did appreciate, really, your uh, very clear, very honest description of the state of the art of research in Europe and uh, position, the mentality we have in this part of the world. Well, let me say that as rotating presidency of the European Union, we do believe that research and training, mobility, career development are issues of capital relevance for the future of Europe are the basic issues for the future of Europe. And I think that we have the, the only this device to acquire this confidence in your future, as you told the, as a, one of the main objective of this uh, period. Whenever Europe has been in troubles, the knowledge of our scientists, of our scholars, was one uh, of the basic way to overcome the crisis. It, it's happened very many times in our history, it happened uh, immediately after the Second War. It happened more uh, in, in the fast, in, uh, far in the, in the history, in the Middle Ages. And I think it, it may happen now, and it's important that we, we do in this direction. Uh, the importance of common policies and programs as uh, Marie Curie actions uh, uh, we are discussing today are was very clear at the very beginning of the European dream or the project of uh, in, in European Union in our founder's mind. And it's even more evident today. We need a closer relationship with, between uh, knowledge creation and European integration. In my opinion, uh, the, the link and the relationship between these two fields, uh, the knowledge creation, the science and research, um, building and the European integration process is very, very uh, close. 
and uh, we have to bring knowledge back to the core of the so-called European integration process. This is the political objectives that the, you, the, the, sta the member states do have now in their political agenda. I think that the competitiveness of European industry needs more innovation and genuine innovation uh, needs uh, strong and integrated research and education systems more, uh, more homogeneous, uh, more shared uh, at European level. And uh, I think that uh, Europe has uh, an advantage, a relative comparative advantage in facing such challenge we can count on the largest, you know very well, on the largest research community in the world. I, I saw the data um, of the researcher's report 2014, uh, the Commission published recently this report, and it shows that there were uh, something like 1 million and 600 uh, European researchers now. And you, you, if you compare with China or the United States, it's uh, quite more than this because the United States now have uh, 1 million and uh, uh, 500 and China uh, to 200 less than this. So we have a huge uh, critical mass of brains. This is our more important capital. And European researchers are by definition innovative, creative, uh, and uh, uh, they also have a strong cultural background. This is the, 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 the typical feature. Uh, we can also assume this feature as a, a difference uh, uh, characteristic in comparison with uh, other uh, researchers in other parts of the world. Um, I had a personal opportunity to witness uh, such a quality when I was a member of the evaluating process uh, for Marie Curie and uh, uh, in the seventh framework program. And my impression then was that uh, the intellectual productivity and excellence of the Marie Curie candidates was really, really very, very, very high profile, also in comparison with the Far East uh, and the emer so-called emerging countries uh, that I, I, I had the opportunity to experience then uh, for the, my previous uh, position. And uh, um, I think that uh, when we, 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 we do something like uh, uh, this uh, uh, celebrating ceremony we, we will have at the end of this conference today. Uh, we, we are going to, to celebrate the winners of the Marie Curie uh, Skodowska actions for this year. Uh, I think that uh, it's a very important sign uh, from the political, from the commission science, uh, side, but it's not enough. Let me say very honestly, it's not enough. I think that uh, a simple thank you not enough today. Uh, your daily work deserves more than a mere recognition and it claims for precise political responsibility. This is my duty now. This is our duty as ministers of uh, higher education research and uh, university in uh, very many countries of Europe. And uh, I think that uh, we, we must also have the courage to, to an announce uh, which are our objectives, which are our political responsibilities in this field. I want to list some of them very clearly. First, I think we have to make national funding to research more transparent and easily accessible for our researchers, enhancing their coordination with European researchers and with, with European resources. It's not uh, so easy for all uh, the uh, member states, it's not for easy for my country, and uh, it's a very important uh, uh, object we have in our political agenda. Second, we need more effective national research systems. Both instruments and objectives should evolve in order to valorize national and transnational comparative advantages. In my opinion, it's now time to talk about quality spending also in the field of research. Third, we need to reinforce the links between public and private sector. I think you will go into discuss about this specific topic in this today's uh, uh, working uh, conference uh, and between public researchers and industry. 
the issue is really urgent in our country. Uh, I, I'm talking to my <laughs> Italian colleagues uh, because you know that uh, the contribution to RD spending target by the private sector in Italy is not enough, is uh, uh, more occasional than uh, a, s a systemic uh, process, and we have to go to this uh, directly to this uh, uh, horizon too in Italy. Fourth, we need high quality research recruited according to merit-based and equitable processes. And we have to, to have the same rules in the different European countries. We don't have uh, now, and uh, this is a problem also in terms of mobility and transfer from a country to another one. Finally, we need to fully integrate research and education in order to make the most of the innovative potential of our young generations. So we have a fifth very important political and specific objectives in our agenda for not only for this uh, semester of Italian presidency, but uh, for the, the future uh, five years of uh, European uh, legislation. And uh, let me say that uh, as rotating president of the European Competitiveness Council, I had occasion to discuss the, this, these issues I mentioned in the meeting with my fellow European colleagues. I already uh, talked uh, about this topic briefly yesterday during the cuttle. And uh, I found uh, um, a, a real unanimous consensus on the need to accelerate uh, on such a process. And it was also very clear in our discussion that one of the main factors improving their scientific impact uh, in the European community and in the relationship, in the comparison between the European community and the rest of the world is mobility. This is one of the key words uh, that uh, also the Commission uh, put uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the real core of, the, uh, of its agenda. Also, Marie Slobowska Curie Action uh, is one one of the tools we have at European level to, to improve mobility of our researchers. And uh, um, global data are really very clear about uh, this topic and uh, its impact uh, uh, in, the, in the successful career of uh, uh, researchers. On average, uh, as far as I know, the research impact of the scientists who move, I mean a change in their affiliations uh, uh, across national boundaries, is nearly 20 higher than those who never moved in their lives. So this is a, a very clear uh, quantitative uh, uh, evidence uh, of the importance of mobility. And let me mention uh, as uh, uh, Italian minister a brilliant instance of this, uh, a very recent brilliant instance, Fabiola Gianotti, uh, who has been really recently chosen uh, as director general of the CERN in Geneva, uh, and she's the, f uh, the first woman as the in, in, in that very important position, is a very good instance uh, of such a, mobi a mobile career. Uh, she uh, had a training in Italy, uh, also in terms of PhD, and then she moved to the United States, and then she came back to Europe, and now she's one of the most high-profile scientists uh, uh, in the world. Uh, so European researchers are already high mobile, uh, international, uh, internationally. Uh, we know that around 30 of uh, uh, European post-PhD researchers have worked abroad, uh, uh, both uh, in Europe and uh, worldwide, for more than three months, uh, at least uh, in, uh, in the last 10 years of their career. Notwithstanding, in my opinion, too many obstacles to research mobility are still in place, and I think that we have to, 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 to be honest also considering the obstacles and the, the question we have to solve, not only the, 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 the very positive, uh, um, the very positive uh, devices uh, we, we have. Uh, that's the reason why in July 2012, uh, two years ago, the European Commission redefined its priorities. You know very well, I, uh, let me mention some of them, to improve the effectiveness of national research systems. And it, it is still, as I, as I told before, one of our basic political objectives to achieve an optimal balance between transnational cooperation and competitiveness, uh, to open up the labor market 
market for researchers to promote gender equality, which is one of the basic uh, uh, purpose of this uh, program, to improve knowledge and circulation, to, to, uh, to give another uh, meaning to the, the, the brain drain, brain gain uh, process uh, and try to, to, to see in another perspective in terms of brain circulation the question of uh, mobility. So I'm glad to say that this process has been recently speeded up and uh, this is also thanks uh, to this kind of actions as uh, Marie Curie and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that we are progressively also considering the importance of science and research, uh, creating a truly European uh, research area, which is one of the basic uh, points in, in the uh, preced Italian presidency agenda in this period. And, but uh, we, we also have uh, to consider some, some uh, other points. Uh, I remember a very, a very nice uh, sentence by Elga Novotny. She's president of the European Research Council. And uh, she rightly pointed out uh, as it follows, knowledge is inherently transgressive. Knowledge seeps in both, uh, like water, in both directions, from science to society, as well uh, as from society to science. This is another mobility process we have to encourage, we have to improve, because science is not uh, something which is uh, only uh, inside our community uh, of uh, university, of uh, research institutions. Science is something which is really very important. It's the basic issues for the future, also for the improvement of the so, the so called civil society. So we have to, to encourage this, uh, this process and this transfer of uh, not only persons, not only brains, uh, not only results of the scientific process, but also in terms of uh, different uh, perspective uh, about the same uh, big challenges. It's not by chance that the European Commission launched the, 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 the big program uh, Horizon 2020, just considering some very, very important, some very, very basic problems uh, the European uh, uh, society needs to face uh, in a multidisciplinary and in an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. There are two, two, two sides of the same coin, and, and I think we have to, 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 to keep in our mind the importance of this, uh, of this uh, uh, very close uh, relation. But let me say that uh, mobility is not only and is not simply a question of uh, geographical movement. Uh, in the EU uh, 28, uh, more than half of the researchers work in the public sector and only 40% uh, uh, in the business sector. You can't compare this data with the United States and with China in this case because they have very, very relevant uh, higher data uh, uh, with benefit of the, of the presence of researchers in the private sector. So another very important question is how can you encourage uh, a true mobility, a true uh, um, interchangeable movement between uh, industries and the university, between uh, universities and uh, public administration. This is the, the, the fertilization process we have to encourage and we have to improve. improve. We want to, if you want to, to obtain uh, the results we need. Then, uh, I think that uh, uh, just uh, referring to the presence of the acting rector of the University of Trento, I think that uh, the PhD and the doctoral schools uh, are the, the very important uh, um, step in the, in the training uh, researchers process uh, which we have to valorize and we have to optimize. Uh, we try to, to, to invest much more money, much more energies in Italy now in this sector of the so-called third level of uh, higher education and I do hope that uh, uh, the European Commission can also dedicate some programs and some investments for this objective too. So, uh, dear friends, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me uh, really uh, warmly thank the European Commission, uh, Mr. Uh, 
Director General uh, Xavier Prat Monet for his presence here, for uh, helping Italy, helping my ministry to organize this conference. And uh, I do hope that the, the, the very brilliant uh, uh, extents uh, by Marie Curie in the history, by Fabiola Gianotti in the present, uh, and there are women, just by, on, by the way, uh, should become a real reference for and point for all, uh, all the, the, the scientific community in Italy and in Europe too. Thank you, Mrs. Minister. Thank you to the speakers and all of you for attending. And now we move to the next session. Thank you.
Possiamo cominciare? Good morning. Welcome uh, to the first session of the keynote address session of the meeting. Uh, I'm Daniela Corda. I'm honored to be the Italian delegate to the Marie Svodowska Curie Action Program Committee, but I'm also a scientist. Actually, I should say I'm first a scientist, so I care very much about the whole process uh, of the era, and so I'm looking forward to the discussion we will have and the results of this conference. Now, uh, the four speakers uh, of this session will address these questions. Where are we now? What's next with the Marisol Dosca Curie Action Program, but with the ERA process, I would say, altogether? And as simple as they might sound, this question, they are extremely important because we are discussing many important things and we have in the past 10, 15 years promoted the very important initiatives, but uh, scientists in the labs would like to see the process faster implemented and to see really Europe, the scientific community in Europe without borders. So this is what we are looking for, and I'm sure that uh, this is something it will be achieved, but uh, the sooner, I would say, the better. So I don't want to take any time from the speakers. Each speaker will have up to 30 minutes. If we will have time for discussion at the end, we might take some questions. Otherwise, we will take questions during coffee break or lunch, but I hope we will have some time at the end by that. So, and uh, uh, we will start, and I give the floor to uh, Dr. Fabienne Gauthier. She's head of the unit of the European Research Area Policy, European Commission, and she has uh, a long experience, I would say, in uh, uh, European policies for uh, science. Please. Thank you, Daniela. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure for me to attend this conference in Trento, an excellent example of a place where the three corners of the innovation triangle meet to create a research, education, and innovation hub. The sheer number of research organizations active in the Trentino region is a testament to the focused effort of public and private bodies coming together to create a common space for knowledge generation. It's a microcosm of what we are trying to achieve at European level, an open space where knowledge, researchers, and technology circulate freely, the European research area. Today, I will cover a few issues which I believe are of paramount importance to improving researchers' prospects in Europe. Our recent ERA progress report, which was published in uh, September of this year, highlighted where we are at national and European level in creating an open European space for knowledge and innovation to thrive. I will touch upon the planned ERA roadmap due next year and the future challenges for ERA in general later on. But before I delve into the wider context of research in Europe, I would like to take a moment to address the topic of the day, empowering <coughs> researchers. How can we empower researchers? How can they be empowered? What can they do? What are the means? How can we help them? We have been working hard to remove the remaining barriers to researcher mobility in order to create a genuine open labor market for researchers, thus making Europe an attractive place to do research. The evidence from our ERA progress report of 2014 is clear. Member states who have open research systems tend to be more innovative, and we have made some excellent progress, and I will give you now a few examples of where we have uh, been very active and where progress can be shown. 
Euraxis, as a first example, is in my view the gateway for any mobile researcher in Europe. Euraxis Services is a network of more than 260 centres, of, of, of which there are two in Trento, in 14 European countries, providing free personalised assistance to any researchers moving into or around Europe. Euraxis Jobs has posted more research vacancies year on year, from 7,500 in 2010 to more than 40,000 vacancies in 2013. I am, and I am pleased to see that Marie Sklodowska Curry Fellowships are also automatically posted on this site. While we are playing our part at European level to ensure that researchers are recruited according to open, transparent and merit-based procedures, I am somewhat concerned that in some countries researchers remain dissatisfied with the way research vacancies are advertised. However, here we are also taking action. The Commission services have initiated a working group led by member states with the participation of stakeholder organisations which will develop a practitioner's toolkit on open recruitment practices to be ready by next year. We can all agree that mobility is a driver of excellence in research and this was highlighted also previously by our distinguished guests. However, many researchers face many difficulties in preserving their pensions benefits when moving between different countries, and this can hamper their mobility. To overcome this problem, the European Commission is supporting employers in creating a single European supplementary pension arrangement. This will enable researchers to remain affiliated to the same pension fund when moving between different countries and changing jobs. On 1st October of this year, a consortium was created by employers willing to take a lead in creating this cross-border pension mechanism. The purpose of the consortium is to prepare the ground for the establishment of a retirement saving vehicle for European research institutions, the so-called ReSaver, with the aim of transferring the first pension contributions in 2015. The European Commission has set aside an envelope of 4 million Euro under Horizon 2020 to help the consortium achieve this goal. In the end, Reserver will prom promote the growth of Europe, Europe's intellectual capital by helping institutions to attract bright young scientists who are reluctant to leave safe universities or lab positions in their home countries. Reserver is an important building block in the creation of the European research area as it will help remove supplementary pensions as a barrier to researchers' mobility. Therefore, we would strongly encourage research organisations across Europe to join the consortium. Another good example is the Charter on Cold, which is playing an increasingly important role in ensuring researchers' rights and obligations are upheld across Europe. I know that the Marie Slogdosa Curry actions have long required Charter and Code principles to be applied and I'm delighted that the new Model Grant Agreement for Horizon 2020 funding includes a requirement under Article 32 to this effect. The Commission is playing its part. The Human Resources Strategy for Researchers, which helps institutions implement the Charter and Code, is gaining traction with a high number of research institutions recording interest and awarded the HR logo. We are currently consulting with how stakeholders on how to st st strengthen this procedure. Similarly, we have provided seven guiding principles in order for our doctoral candidates to get the best possible education and training they can. The principles for innovative doctoral training are being taken up across Europe and will give our doctoral candidates the best possible environment to carry out and exploit their research. Today's doctoral candidates have global opportunities and Europe has global competition. If Europe is to compete on a global scale, it must maintain its commitment to innovation and research excellence. Investment in education, research and innovation is above all investment in people, their knowledge and also their talents. If we want to continue to compete with the best and attract and retain the best, then we have to adapt to society's changing needs. Doctoral training must increasingly meet the needs of an employment market that is wider than academia. Training researchers just to be researcher in academia is no longer sufficient. 
We know the majority of researchers will pursue careers outside the university environment. From the outset, knowledge transfer should be given more recognition as part of the academic career. Researchers should be better attuned to the innovation potential of their findings, and academics should be trained in entrepreneurial skills. Innovative doctoral training will give European doctoral candidates the skills needed to meet the 21st century's employment needs, in short, empowerment. The Commission, together with Member States, is giving and will continue to give full backing to the implement implementation of innovative doctoral training across Europe. This is why we also have opened up the structural funds to support universities in their uptake of these principles. Through our funding mechanism in Horizon 2020, we will support up to 70,000 doctoral candidates in innovative doctoral training. We will launch calls on institutions with innovative concepts worth 25 million euros in Horizon 2020, which also will include innovative doctoral training. Under the Marie Slodowska Curry program in Horizon 2020, which includes industrial doctorates and supports researchers at all stages of their career, we will fund over 25,000 PhDs. This will become the main funding program for doctoral training, and you will have more details about this uh, later on uh, in the day. If innovative doctoral training is to be entrenched in PhD programs, it also needs sustainable funding. Having project-based innovative doctoral training funding will not deliver long-term benefits. Therefore, co-funding from the EU or other sources cannot become the norm. Doctoral candidates should receive funding for the duration of their studies, usually three to four years. As the skills gained are largely for the benefit of the private sector, appropriate funding from industry should also be considered. I'm convinced that the implementation of this principle will give Europe a stronger research base for the future. All these instruments and schemes I just uh, mentioned strongly support the realization of the European research area. As the recent ERA progress report has shown, the conditions for an open European research space is in, are in place. More clearly needs to be done, of course, and I'm looking forward to seeing how member states intend to implement ERA reforms in the coming months. The completion of the European research area, much like the internal market, is a gradual process. We have, at European level, put the measures for the European research area to be a success. Now, member states and their institutions are the primary actors who will introduce the ERA reforms at national level and support the implementation by research funding and research performing organizations. Member States have made a good deal of progress in aligning their national research agendas to the ERA priorities. I would now encourage Member States to engage with us and, with the, and the research stakeholder organizations in our reinforced partnership to implement at an operational level the necessary ERA reforms. The ERA roadmap at European level to be developed by mid-2015 by the Member States will be instrumental to guide the implementation of ERA nationally, while acknowledging the diversity of national research systems. I would also call on Member States to take full account of ERA when preparing national research and innovation strategies implemented by tailor-made ERA national action plans and initiatives. And I have a message for those institutions that are lagging behind in their implementation of ERA. Our analysis shows that ERA-compliant organizations produce a high number of publication and patent applications by researchers. Hence, researchers in ERA-compliant organizations generate more knowledge, which in turn contributes to growth and jobs. I would therefore strongly encourage those member states who do not have the measures in place to support ERA to do so. It will help them to increase their research and innovation potential, and it will help Europe become an open space where knowledge can circulate freely. I would like to take this opportunity to inform you of an event next year where all the three partners of the, re of the reinforced ERA partnership, the member state, the commission, and the stakeholder organization will come together. Next year in Brussels, we will hold a conference in June in order to gather the three main actors of the European research area. 
this will be a perfect opportunity for us and also for these actors to take stock and plot the way forward for ERA. Ladies and gentlemen, let us acknowledge that being a researcher is not an easy career choice. You have to fight for funding, you have to fight for your vacancies where the recruitment systems might not, not always be in your favour, and you might encounter mobility-related obstacles when moving jobs. In spite of these challenges, researchers choose this career path largely because of their passion for the profession. It is our jobs as policy makers to make that profession as attractive as possible. Let us work together to make it a reality. Let's make the European research area work for researchers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. This was, <coughs> this was really a nice start because you uh, summarize well where we are at the moment. And I think we cannot take questions, as I said, so we'll proceed with uh, Professor Luigi uh, Berlinguer and uh, uh, eventually after take some questions. Please. He's former minister of the Italian government and member of EU parliament. Sorry not to say that. No. <coughs> Specify. Former, former. Not good with this. <laughs> the Union shall have the objective of strengthening its scientific and technological basis by achieving a European research area in which researchers' scientific knowledge and technology circulate freely and encouraging it to become more competitive, including in its industry, and so forth. I'm quoting an article of Lisbon Treaty, something like the Constitution of Europe. Article 179, let's say a new article. And what does it mean? It is not only a right for each researcher. It's also a duty. The institutions have to realize and to build up concretely European research area. It doesn't work? No, it's me. It is not an optional. I would like to stress this concept. It's written in our constitution, let's say so, roughly speaking. The Commission has prepared and presented some communications since 2000s and has promoted new steps. Researchers in the era, one profession, multiple careers. And then in 2008, better careers and more mobility, a European partnership for researchers addressing some four main themes open recruitment and portability for grants, researchers' mobility with respect to social security and pension. This is new. It's a particular sensitivity. Employment and attractive employment um, and conditions, training, skills and experiences of, of researchers. This is good. And what is good is the environment of this meeting and the title not definitely new but uh, meaning <coughs> that there are some ideas that are circulating in this field because not only institutions are called to build up an era, an era but also people also workers also researchers mainly them Concrete life of workers within the environment should be the engine of error, what pushes to its concrete realization. And I would like to stress, I would like to recall, the European Council in October 2013 were stating that for the purposes of the full realization, let me stress full realization of the European research area by 2014 in order to 
improve mobility, pension funds, careers, and so forth. This year was the <coughs> goal that came out from the, Euro the European Council, the, the top of the institutions in, uh, in Europe. But in February 2014, the Competitiveness Council and its conclusions on progress, not full realization, progress. Let me stress the words. <coughs> progress to develop, um, and, and, and to, be, um, to improve mobility, pension, and so forth. Uh, conclusion on progress in the European research area uh, looked at 2015 about era and 15. When I was minister or secretary general of the Italian Conference of Rectors, and even in my personal work at the university, I felt deeply that research organized on national basis is not a good concept. It's poor, can be competitive in the multi, <coughs> in the mondialized world. But we need competitiveness. We got something new with framework programs. Let me recall Antonio Ruberti about it, which is a name in my country and only. We got the framework program. It was a success. But now it is not enough at all because the FP is only 5% of the expenses in Europe for research. It's a drop in the sea. It is not enough at all. If, you rel if we rely on the framework programs, we are out of the future. And uh, the framework program is something not European as a, an environment of research, but only Europe delivers money to member states. And we come back always to member states. This is not era, absolutely. We need a truly integrated era. And that's at the point. Which feasible actions can boost the mobility and the employability of the researchers? Mr. Monnier has uh, said that many talents are out all, already, uh, how to say, judged as talents, and they are out of, uh, of what we can call the uh, scientific community in Europe. Let, and let me, prob, let me be proud of the quotation by the program of the Italian presidency of our initiative named a Maastricht for Research, adopted with a great majority in the European Parliament, in the European Parliament. Do you remember a Maastricht for Research, October 2013? In this manifesto were indicated seven priorities and key actions. Defragmentation, cross-border cooperation, research infrastructures, knowledge sharing, a European research career, innovative doctoral programs, also era mark, which is something we have to discuss about. The initiative used the symbol Maastricht, which is an economic symbol. Research as investment, fiscal advantages, lower costs. So we didn't want to only to state the necessity of an environment for research, but to promote something concretely, supporting ERA concretely, supporting ERA concretely. And that's why I see the title of this conference, An Open Labor Market for Empowered Researchers. The conclusion of the Competitive Council of February 2014, a, a rem uh, stresses this, uh, a, this idea, but we must say that to remove obstacles of implementation of ERA is not now encouraged 
enough. This is my opinion. This is the why, the reason I have to speak in this conference. Just to build up an open labor market needs many, many things, uh, and to go ahead about what we are going to say and work in the field. We have mm, we have listed some of the problems that will be discussed during the conference. But the idea of intersectorial mobility, the idea of relationship between academia and private sectors, even SMEs especially, and vice versa, the idea of brain circulation, not brain drain, brain moving from the poor country to the rich country, all these things mean that we have to change our mentality about ERA, to change our attitude. ERA is not yet concretely, and frankly speaking, a proper political priority, a real concern of European authorities and member state authorities. <coughs> it is not a proper concern. It does mean that not all the necessary efforts are engaged to this goal. It is still far from its realization. Because we need facts, not only institutional architecture. I've heard here and somewhere else good words. The good, how to say, the, the good uh, um, architecture of the conference. The message that comes out speaking uh, from this conference. But we don't need only formal decision, but so also a bottom-up pressure that comes from concrete life of researchers itself. And uh, uh, in, in just presenting their daily life as researchers as the deeper need of era, of a, a wider environment for research. This is the point. Let me try to and, uh, and, um, uh, underline some points. Let's underline some point. We have to find the linkage between research and education. The best level of uh, research in the universities is just underlined by Humboldt idea. Humboldt idea, which is, if you add a third mission, the way to present the modernity of the idea. <coughs> Linkage between research and education, which means not only transmission. I, I like the, what, uh, uh, what Mr. Monet said here. Research. Education is continually research. Even learning is continually research. Any attitude in the field of education from the, uh, from the promoter of education, which is the learning center education is something that uh, uh, is pushed by by interest creativity curiosity participation it is arrows that moves the society and we can we must feel what uh, the research means in the great area of pleasure of arrows you know and this is the point i want to stress when you say that <coughs> We, we, we must find the bottom-up pressure to get to a result. We have listed some of our problems. To, over, uh, to, to go further than uh, um, fragment, defragmentation. A stronger political commitment by the member states is certainly needed in order to support such a goal. But in, in this respect, we, ma we need something, some norms, something uh, more realistic that could uh, 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 help us to overpass fra fragmentation, which is one, one of the reasons of the weakness of our research in, in Europe. An organic uh, strategy of internationalization of European research uh, making best use of uh, potential global partnerships. And then cross-border integration, which means uh, um, integrations in, um, in the cooperation between uh, um, states and states, uh, 
cross border integration means that we, we, we could not go on working only inside our member state uh, and, and to develop joint programming initiatives and so forth. Research infrastructure, I only quote it. Knowledge sharing, I only quote it. And European research career, this is the most important agent at the present time. The engine, the future generation of European researchers. We don't have this uh, in, in our next future uh, in, 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 as, as a goal. It must become a goal from this point, concretely goal, financed goal, portability of national grants, coordinated system of social security, transparent publication of competition, implementation of the charter and the code of conduct for researchers, but mainly access to any program, even of single member states, by any researcher working on this now new native land, which is Europe, innovative doctoral programs, and so forth, and so forth. We have found too many resistances. It has, the, 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 the minister has quoted them as obstacles. They are obstacles. This is a neutral definition. They are not only obstacles, they are somewhere resistances. I am, characterially speaking, an enthusiastic, and I believe in culture and science, and in my colleagues, academicians and researchers. I thought that in the Republic of Lettres, the République des Lettres, there are resources and bases for a dream of a European integration our second native land. During our initiative on Maastricht for research, we found a, a large consensus, but also some groups inside of European research and university associations, which was a cool attitude, not convinced, surely not enthusiastic, tradition, our old good rules, interests, no confidence in new experiences and in their mistakes, which sometimes are not well conceived and organized. And sometimes this kind of skepticism is reasonable. I understand it. But in any case, the response risks to be cool. What is the right attitude? Today's agenda and issue proposed is so concrete and based on real needs for researchers and research help a lot. And even this conference, our task and the way to proceed towards ERA. We must conclude this meeting thinking and desiring to help the progress and the process. We are happy to read that ERA is a priority of the Italian, and to hear, because she spoke this morning, my minister of my country, is a, a priority of the Italian presidency. We look at the result of the European Council October 2013, and its recommendation to the Commission to go on and to get to an end in the era business. We look at next competitiveness council now in December, hoping and asking, we should ask in this conference, for a convincing and urgent concrete conclusion in the frame of ERA. Norms, measures, and funds. Something concrete. If possible, only one thing, but something that shows that we are moving concretely. But first of all, I deep feel to address in my, my world, the world of research and university, of intellectuals, that we need not only a favorable eye, favorable eye, a soft attitude towards era, we need overall that intellectuals play a role as a guide to lead Europe in its progress, integration, to lead the Europeanization of research to build up within our community 
Europe, not only out in the institutions, but within our community to build up Europe. A hundred years ago, facing the incoming First World War, Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein, refused to participate to the war, in the war, to be involved. He was a scientist. He was against wars and war and launched a manifesto to the Europeans 100 years ago. Let me quote some words. While Einstein, while technology and commerce clearly compel us to recognize the bond between all nations and thus a common world culture, no war has ever so intensively disrupted cultural cooperation at the present time perhaps on our acute awareness of the disruption that we know, we, that we now sense so painfully, is due to the numerous common bones we once shared. Through technology the world has become smaller, some pieces of the manifesto. The states of the larger peninsula of Europe today move in the orbit of one another, much as did the cities of each small Mediterranean peninsula in ancient times. Through a complex of interrelationships, Europe now displays a unity based on the needs and the experience of every individual. Thus, it would appear to be the duty of educated and well-meaning Europeans, intellectuals, I mean, at the very least to attempt to prevent Europe as a result of an imperfect organization of the whole from suffering the same fragile, tragic fate which befall ancient Greece. We have seen the end of Greece after so many centuries. It seems not only good but rather bitterly necessary that intellectuals of all nations marshal their influence such that Whatever the still uncertain end of the war may be, the terms of peace shall not become the cause of future wars. We are firmly convinced that the time has come when Europe must act as one in order to protect her soul, her inhabitants, and her culture. First, still Einstein speaking. It is necessary, however, that Europeans get together and if enough Europeans in Europe can be found, that is to say, people from whom Europe is not merely a geographical concept, but rather a worthy object of affection, then we shall try to call together a union of Europeans. Such a union shall then speak and decide. A scientist, an intellectual, years before, years before Spinelli and the others. An intellectual, proud as a scientist, to lead prophetic Europe unity and integration. This is what intellectuals should continue in present times. For their own world, for our community as intellectuals, to build up Europe, not only as institution, geographically speaking, on the territory of Europe, of the continent, but among us, within our community. And this must be, first of all, era. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Professor Berlinguer. Your words are very important and uh, your, uh, the concepts shared by all, I think, here, we all want a Europe, one Europe, to compete with the rest of the world. We have exactly five minutes, so uh, I guess we can take one or two questions for the two speakers we had, in, or comments, if you like, for the speakers we had in this first part of the session. Is someone willing to start? No hand? Yes, we have a hand over there, fi fifth row, please. 
Could you uh, kindly say your name? Yeah, hello uh, everyone. I'm Sebastian Huber from Science Europe. Um, I was just, this was a question to uh, Madame Gauthier. Uh, you mentioned um, an ERA compliant uh, organization. Um, I think many organizations are represented here. Maybe it would be um, interesting for, for us if you could uh, give a short description or brief description of what such an organization would be, please. Thank you for your question. Um, to highlight maybe to the audience, indeed, ERA compliant organization is a terminology which is used in our ERA progress report 2014. What we have um, done uh, through our ERA progress report is that we have assessed, we have made an assessment on uh, the progress um, of the era of the uh, of the uh, research funding and research performing organizations in Europe in relation to their compliance with uh, the era policy context that would be in place at uh, national level um, in our era communication we have identified five priorities for era and the first one is on um, effective national research systems linked to the way funding is allocated to institutions. Then we have cross-border collaboration, just mentioned by Professor Beringer also in one of his examples. We have uh, mobility and recruitment of researchers. We have, um, we have gender and we have also knowledge transfer. On all these five priorities, um, the, com the Commission, in its communication in 2012, has identified a certain number of actions which member states, stakeholder organizations and the Commission have to do in order to make sure that under these five priorities we make progress on ERA in order to ensure that we get this recirculation of researchers, knowledge and technology. And um, one of the essential aspects of implementing our ERA policy is that we measure this progress. We wanted to look uh, through our progress report how far member states, commission and stakeholders are going in implementing this, the, the ERA. And in our progress report of this year, we have tried to match uh, to see uh, how far ERA is implemented in the organization with regard to the policy measures which are in place at national level when there is an era strategy legislation on a certain topic around this five along these five priorities how institutions are implementing this this is to situate the context and we have tried to match to see how this implementation at concrete level is going on with regard to the uh, policy context in place and the era compliant institution are those institutions where we have um, identified along some specific criteria under these five priorities which I just mentioned, how we, compared to a European level, how far these institutions are implementing well or implementing frequently or are not implementing uh, the ERA actions at national level. So within this context, we have identified some organizations which would be compliant compared to a European level and in certain, area of, in, in certain of these five priorities. Um, and this is clearly explained, this is also explained more in details in, because I will not go into the details of the, indication, of the indicators, but just as a key word for you to remember is that we have tried to match how ERA is implemented with regard to the policy measures in place. And we have compared all over the 28 member states and with the associated countries, whether these institutions are above or below an average. We have found that some ERA compliant institutions do very well. In some countries, member states do very well and the institutions do very well, which is a very positive sign in terms of realizing this uh, open labor market for research. Nevertheless, even if some member states do very well, there are still some fields, um, to take an example on gender or on cross-border collaboration, where also these member states need to do more. So the progress report of this year shows a global picture where we have an indication of those who do well, but also 
where some additional progress needs to be done at national level. This is the picture that we provide in our progress report. So we have clustered the organization along a certain number of criteria in order to see how much we have made progress over the past two years. Okay, thank you. I think it's now time for coffee. So um, thanks to the speaker from the first part of the session and to the audience. Please be back couple of minutes, let's say uh, 11, 11, 5, 11, 7. I mean, we need to start at 11, 10 sharp, so please be back on time. Uh, um, I would like to ask here to the podium now, for uh, since we have to organize something, I mean, the awardees of the Maris Vodoska Curie Prize and also the member of the evaluation committee. Could both the awardees and the member of the evaluation committee come here to the front of the room, to the podium, now? Thank you. Sorry, the coffee break of 20 minutes. Acting the people. If people can take their seats, we should start. We are already five minutes late. My call for punctuality was totally unearthed. Pure voi arrivate tardi. Could you rapidly take your seat, please, so that we can start? Can people come inside fastly, as fast as possible, watching the steps, though? <laughs> okay. I guess we are ready for the second part of the keynote session. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Conor O'Carroll, 
who's uh, chair of the ERA steering group on human resources and mobility and uh, has been involved in career development and uh, for a long, long time, I would say. Please, Carol, Connor. Grazie, Daniela. Buongiorno a tutti. Innanzitutto, vorrei ringraziare il, minist il Ministero dell'Istruzione per l'invito e l'ospitalità della provincia autonoma di Trento e l'Università degli Studi di, di Trento stesso. Io sono stato mobile nella mia carriera, infatti ero, ho fatto il dottorato qui in Italia come borsista Marie Curie. E io vorrei sottolineare che il valore di mobilità non è solo quello della scientifica, ma ha pure anche un valore culturale che è molto molto importante, soprattutto per l'obiettivo del European Research Area, come ha detto prima il signor Bellinger. Ok, I'll continue in English. I was just pointing out that... <laughs> you did very well. You did very well. Before I, before I frightened the, the interpreters. Um, <laughs> what, um, what I wanted to point out was, and I think it is most important, that the, the objectives of a European research area are not just about scientific objectives. They are about cultural. They are about the unity of Europe. And if I think in a very local sense, 100 years ago here today, you were at war with Austria. And we have many Austrians in the audience. So times have changed uh, in, <laughs> for the positive, I think. But what I want to talk about specifically is the evolution of the doctorate and how this has, ch how this has changed and how this should change into the future right across Europe. And I think one of the important things um, we, we heard earlier on today was that um, we have approximately across Europe about 745,000 doctoral candidates right across the Euro Euro European Union. That's, a, that's an enormous number of people. Over the next seven years, we're going to see in the Horizon 2020 program, we're going to see about 35,000 doctoral candidates being funded. No, no, it's okay. We're not moving yet. No, no, it's okay. Ah, it's okay. okay. Um, about 35,000 doctoral candidates being funded. That's a small amount in one sense. But, and I think what, what, what the point I'm going to emphasize today, the example of the Marie Curie actions in particular provides an excellent model or paradigm for doctoral funding and doctoral training right across Europe. And while the 35,000 are a small drop. They can be a driver of change for doctoral education right across Europe. Now, when you have time later, and I'm sure this, that these slides will be available to download, you can go through this game of uh, snakes and ladders, or the PhD game, to, um, to, 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 uh, in an idle moment. But I think it, it, what it is, demonstrates to you is very much the traditional PhD. The one student one supervisor model, which has been around for many, many years in Europe. And I think if you really want to see something very entertaining, then I would very much recommend that you watch this film. It's the phdmovie.com. And if you're doing a PhD, have done a PhD, you will understand everything that this film talks about. It's, it's, it's very entertaining and, 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 and good when you're despairing about that you're never going to finish. But let me come back to what my theme around this talk is today. This is a piece of data from New Zealand. And in fact, there is similar data from right around the world, from the UK, from Europe, it's the United States, which shows that really, for people who do doctorates, only a very small number actually become researcher academics in the long term. In this particular instance, we're looking at around less than 2%. It's not much more than 5% internationally. Times have changed. In the past, 20, 30 years ago, relatively small numbers of people did PhDs. That has radically changed with greater investments in research. And with that has brought great pluses, but also great negatives in the sense that we have too many people who have been trained through a system was purely for acad academia. 
This is a very good piece of data from the National Science Foundation in the US, and it actually illustrates one of the things they do very well, which is to track their people, to find out where they go, to look at where people go long term. But when you look at that, from 1973 to 2006, you see that the number of people who, be, who went through the PhD system to become, 80% of them in 1973 were becoming academics. Now, by 2006, this had dropped to less to 40%. Conversely, the number of postdocs had increased in that same period. And this is a trend, while it's very well illustrated in the US by this data, I'm quite sure that we would see exactly the same trends for Europe as well. Because one of the problems in this, in this area, in fact, is, the, is often the lack of data and detailed information on this. This gives here, just in terms of data, the increase in the number of doctoral graduates per thousand population. And this is going from 2000 to 2011. And again, we see significant increases. I mean, you look at there, in the case of the European Union, you're looking at nearly a doubling of the number of doctoral graduates in that period. By the way, for this talk, all of the data I'm presenting to you is coming from a number of different organizations, but particularly from the Researcher's Report 2014, the European Research Area Progress Report 2014, and the MORE2 study, a comprehensive piece of uh, statistical work that was carried out by the European Commission. And you can find all of these documents, they're all on the Euraxis website. So if you want one place to go to find the information, go to Euraxis, it's all there. This gives a little bit more detail in terms of individual countries as to where people are, um, the number of people who are and the changes in doctoral candidates. And you can see in some countries the changes are small, in others they are extremely large. Now, this was the um, title of an editorial in Nature earlier this year, in fact, um, quite, quite recently, that there is life after academia. And for many of you in the audience um, who, are, who are actually pursuing a PhD, you may not think that at the moment. But sooner or later, you will become to the reality that uh, perhaps the academic life is not for you or, it, or simply the opportunities are not there and you will need to look to other, other opportunities. And this is where we come to the PhD and the, ch and the changes that are needed and indeed are underway in the PhD to ensure that, um, that people can have greater opportunities for much wider career progression after their doctorate. Let me give you a little bit about the European approach to this, both in terms of funding and also in terms of policy. I think, let's go to Marie Curie because I think it is the best example here. The Marie Curie fellowships began in the early 1980s and really they were just to get people moving. Get people across borders, get them working in other labs, get them moving within Europe. We already had a fairly good flux of researchers to the United States. That was a very strong European tradition. But what we didn't have was a great exchange of people across borders within Europe, except for a few exceptional cases. And for many years, in fact, the Marie Curie only took a name in 1996. Up to then, they had various different names of European fellowships, European grants, etc. But after 20 years in operation, they did some work in terms of, well, what, was still, what obstacles were there to mobility? What was stopping people from moving? What was preventing movement across Europe? And indeed, you know, at that time, remember that in 1992, we had the single, we had the single market for trade, for openness of, 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 uh, of goods and, uh, and the economy. What we didn't have was a very open market for knowledge and people. And indeed, out of a piece of work that came in obstacles to mobility, and indeed the definition of the, what originally wasn't called the, quite the European research area in 2000, but really it was the concept, it was the idea of a single European market for people and knowledge, crossing borders, having a borderless Europe in that sense. And there were many obstacles at that time. Now things have changed significantly, and I think when you look at the list of things that have happened by 2014, it is quite impressive. We have the Euraxis service network across Europe, over 200 centres providing support for researchers. We fast track immigration in many countries. There has been some reversals in this area in recent years, but I think this is changing again. We have the European Researchers Charter and Code, the principles for innovative doctoral training, 
European Framework for Research Careers, and many more. As Fabienne mentioned some earlier this morning, and I'd emphasise as well the Resaver, the European Pension for Researchers, which is a critical part of mobility. One of the problems about moving country is, and I know of myself, every time you move you lose money because you transfer a pension fund, you never get the full value as you go from country to country. As you know, of course, in 2013, um, Marie Curie was named to Marie Skłodowska Curie, um, relating to the fact that Marie Curie herself was highly mobile coming from Poland. And um, it has evolved from what you would call that simple transnational fellowship program to something far more complex and structured and promoting change in terms of doctoral training and indeed farther on in research and career development. And it's important to see that it is cemented into the pillar of science within Horizon 2020, along with the European Research Council. And I think this is most important. Marie Curie was often seen as something on the sidelines, a little bit of mobility for people. It's far more important than that. And within the Marie Curie program, more than 50% of their budget is devoted to the PhD doctoral training. And it includes, it has absorbed the Erasmus program from the previous, uh, from, from the previous, uh, from, from the previous edu edu education programs. Just going back to ERA itself, we've had a number of things in terms of history. The declaration of the objective of a European research area, targeting spend of 3% of GDP on research. And in 2010, the Lisbon Treaty, and Mr. Berlinger referred to this earlier, and I think this can't be overstressed, because up to then, the ERA objective was something, it was an objective, but it was, it, it, it was made law. It's a legal objective of the European Union in the treaty, and moreover, which is most important, the framework programs are the tools for implementing ERA. They are the means by which one can try to bring change about across Europe. Now, there's a deadline of 2014. Will that deadline be met in full? No, it won't. It won't it'll be met in some instances, not in others. But I think one has got to look at a deadline like this, just like the single market in 1992. The single market deadline was declared, we have a single market. We didn't actually have a single market in 92. There were many obstacles to be still overcome, but it was the principle of declaration in showing that much had been achieved towards that end. It's hard to work with a very large policy objective. So the best way to deal with it is pick five topics. Pick five critical topics which people identify as absolutely necessary for achieving the European research area. This is the five here. More effective national systems, more open international peer review, transnational co collaboration, the open labour market for researchers, gender balance, knowledge circulation, open access to data. I highlight the one here on the open labour market because it's the one which our, our steering group is responsible for in terms of policy development. Now let's go to era policy development specifically on the PhD. The steering group in human resources and mobility, it comprises of the member states, candidate countries, the associated countries to the framework program. All in all, we have about 35 countries participating in this endeavor to develop very clear practical solutions and practical tools for implementing ERA in terms of the open labour market for researchers. In addition to that, we would work with a number of stakeholders across Europe. The European Universities Association, the League of European Research Universities, Eurodoc, Vitae UK. Important stakeholders have significant work in this area. And not forgetting Science Europe, as I see Sebastian there. Um, our report on PhDs and the concept of innovative doctoral training was published in 2011. It's been integrated into the European Higher Education Area Policy and is integrated into the Horizon 2020 programme. And moreover, there were some pilot programmes within Marie Curie in 2012 and 13 to see if one could actually do some fast track implementation, which actually proved very, very successful. Now, I think one important thing that when we were looking at changes to the doctorate itself, we had to be very careful because the doctorate has a long tradition. Its tradition is based on the fact that it is a piece of original work 
carried out by an individual under supervision for somebody more advanced that is then published. It's published as a thesis or in some countries it's published in the Scandinavian countries it's published as a series of peer-reviewed publications. But the point is it is an original piece of research. It is quite different from a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in terms of structure and how it's organised. And I think that when we discussed the evolution of the PhD and doctoral training itself, we wanted to be very clear that this would be based very firmly in the Bologna process as well and around the Salzburg principles one and two, which that the core component of the, doctor, of the doctorate is original research. This is a different type of qualification. Whatever other things are brought in or introduced, that is still the fundamental nature of the doctorate. And I think that you could, when you look at the doctorate as a, as a, um, as a degree, it's, it's very interesting because it's seen as the, uh, as, as the passage point, the point upon which some, somebody um, is allowed to become a researcher, like getting a driving license. And one, 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 can, one can take it to the, to, to the level where there, there's, a, there's a case which has been going on for a number of years of a, of a scientist, Henrik Schoen, who was um, discovered to have been um, dealing in fraud, in scientific fraud, back over, over 10 years ago. He was, um, he was working in the Bell Laboratories in the United States at the time, and the, the, public, the work he published in Nature was shown, was shown to be false. He falsified his data. He was thrown out of his job, and the University of Constance in Germany, which had awarded him his doctoral thesis, revoked the thesis because their perspective was, this is a license to carry out research. We do not think you, you have the authority to carry out research anymore. Now, in fact, he took that to the highest court in Germany and lost the case. But it, it, does, it was a perspective. Not everybody would share that perspective, but it was a perspective of, uh, of an institution saying, we have given you a license to carry out research. We have accredited you to do this. If you have gone and falsified data, we do not believe you have, you, you have the right to continue to do that. But it is the transition point from being student to researcher. And the, the principles that were developed, the seven principles of innovative doctoral training, and I'm going, going to go through each of them and talk a little bit about each one of them. We could spend all day talking about them, by the way, but we don't have that time, so I'll just focus a little bit on each one. The first one is research excellence. Second, attractive institutional environment. The third, interdisciplinary research options. The fourth is exposure to relevant employment sectors. The fifth, international networking. The sixth, transferable skills training. And the seventh, the quality assurance, or the, what I would think probably better to call the PhD life cycle. So let's just go through each of these one by one briefly to give you some sense of where we're coming from. If we look at research excellence, then I think that nobody would argue the fact that when students are looking for a doctoral opportunity, they want to go to the best place possible for their research. They want the best laboratory, they want the best library, they want access to the best facilities. This is something which is the, the aspiration of all students looking to complete their doctorate. When you look at, um, when you look at data around, around public, and there's lots and lots of data around this, but just, just a few points here that you see where Europe does lag behind the United States in terms of our, looking at our top 10% of cited publications. Now, I accept the fact that one can have many questions about citations, etc., this, but it is an indicator, and there are many others, but this particular one shows that. Interesting to see that uh, within Europe, and I think this is a great, this is a good thing to see, that 85 to 95 percent of our European researchers are publishing with other researchers in Europe, and this is great. This is what you would really like to see. I mean, people do publish, of course, with colleagues across, across the world, but mainly within, within Europe itself. And I have little doubt that, the, um, that, the, that funding, like the Framework Programme's funding, has actually encouraged that more and more over time. And now there is the fact that, I mean, that the, the big countries in Europe obviously will have, uh, are in collaboration with most other countries in Europe, France, Germany, Italy, and the UK. That is there, that just gives a a very brief overlook of the percentage of publications from each country that are in the top 10% of cited countries right around the world. 
I'm not going to dwell on these particular graphs. I just wanted to show you they're there. All this data is available for you on the Euraxis website. And I think it's worth going to have a look at these. In terms of an attractive institutional environment, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, the, well, the first thing is one's got to think about how are, what kind of facilities are available. But I'm not just talking about the hard facilities, the laboratory facilities. I'm talking about the structural facilities for students when they come in. How are they treated? Are they treated as part of a cohort of students or are they treated simply as somebody who's going to do a piece of work in the lab, spend a number of years there, get a qualification and leave? And I think that's, the, that, that's where the attractive institutional environment comes in. And this is highly relevant for the European Researchers' Charter and Code. This is what the European Researchers' Charter and Code aimed, aimed to do when it, when, when it was um, published in 2000 and 2005. And it was to recognise the rights of researchers, also their responsibilities, because researchers have responsibilities as well as rights. And what we saw was that um, over 480 organisations across Europe endorsed the European Charter and Code representing over 1,200 universities, research organisations and funding agencies, also representative bodies as well. Now, the Charter and Code is a rather large object to do anything with on its own. It's very big. It's a lot of different uh, principles. I forget the numbers, but there's, they're very large. And to try and deal with it in a very specific way, the Commission introduced the Human Resources for Researchers strategy, which now awards a logo the human, the, the human resources logo to institutions which follow this strategy. And it really is to get, and one of, one, of the big, one of the big impacts that it's had on institutions is that what it does, and we've seen it here, in fact, I, I participated briefly in Italy uh, earlier in the summer, um, while on summer holidays, at the University of Camerino as part of their review of the human resources strategy. And, and the, um, what it does is it brings different elements of the universities together. It brings the research side of the university along with the human resources side and the administrative side. And as we all know in universities, those two sides often don't mix very well. But it works. That's what it does, and it does it extremely well. It makes people in HR think about researchers, not simply as short-term staff members, but people whose career needs to be developed, even from an early point. Now, 2015 will mark 10 years of the Charter and Code, and I believe the Commission might have something planned for somewhere in March of, of, of next year to, to mark that particular event. This is um, a piece of data uh, gathered from the More 2 study of the share of researchers who believe that recruitment process at their institution is sufficiently transparent. There's a wide range here, but What's, what's, what, to me is, uh, what to me is most noticeable is the fact that when you look at this, that you've got more than, on average across Europe, 40% think that, um, yeah, I know what you're laughing at. <coughs> um, okay, who's at the bottom? Italy's at the bottom, UK at the top. I, 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 I think that's, to me, I think that's irrelevant. I think that's actually, to me, that's a bit irrelevant because I think what's more important is the fact that more than 40% on average across Europe think this, the system isn't good. Let's forget about you know, individual countries. Let's look right across Europe. You, you cut down there. You've got nearly 40% of people right across, right across Europe think the system uh, needs to be fixed. So there is, you know, th 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 there is work to be done right across the European Union. In terms of interdisciplinary research options, it is seen, and I think this is, this, is, this is a relatively new phenomenon. Traditionally, people worked within their disciplines. They worked within their physics, their life sciences, their chemistry disciplines, very, very clearly. They were well separated. And indeed, the university structures mirror that. One knows that things were based on university departments. We have seen in recent years changes in that. Changes driven by a number of different factors, by the fact that disciplines are talking to one another a lot more. Areas of, say, like bioinformatics is where intense computer science is needed in an area of genomics. So it, it is where there's a necessity for disciplines to talk to one another from the scientific perspective. There is also the societal perspective. And when one looks at, at, at societal challenges in terms of, of energy, of climate, of health, of its citizens, then one needs to bring disciplines together. You cannot talk about the health of citizens purely in a medical terms. You've got to talk about it in social terms as well. And what is happening is, of course, that interdisciplinarity is being driven by European funding and indeed by national funding as well. 
exposure to relevant employment sectors. Now, this is interesting data here as well, because around one in four researchers doing a PhD were mobile outside of academia as part of their PhD. But when you look at the data, only about 4% were active in, the, in, in industry, in what we call private industry, 9% in private not-for-profit, and 10% in the public or government sector. I mean, that is nonetheless very good, because remember that not everybody's going to work in private sector anyway. They are going to work in the public, in, in the public non, in private non-for-profit and the public sector. So it, it is good as part of the PhD to have that experience. But nonetheless, it is only 23%. It is a small number. And what's interesting, actually, is the proportion of researchers who've had um, workplaces or in a work, you know, work placement or intern, internship is actually higher in the newer member states than in the older member states. So that's a, and it, it, it's usually the opposite for many, of, for many of these statistics. There's some more data there in detail. I won't dwell on the data for the moment. International networking, I think this is something where many people have started in terms of their international mobility as students, as researchers, etc. But I think most people would say it, it has had a positive effect on their career, but not everybody. It very much depends where you come from and where you're going back to. Some countries, if you leave the country, it is quite hard to get back into the system afterwards. So mobility can actually be a negative in the sense that if you go, you don't go back. So one always has to keep that in mind, that while there is plenty of opportunities for mobility in terms of, in, in terms of availability, the actual advantages are not there for everybody. Of the um, estimate of, the, of this estimated 745,000 doctoral candidates in Europe, 68% were Europeans studying in their own country. 8% were Europeans studying in another European country, and the rest were 24% from outside the EU. So in fact, there's a significant number of people coming to Europe to do their doctorates from outside. And, and when you look at you know, like, what countries are they coming from outside of Europe, but the principal country is China, India, and, and broader Asia are the, main, are, are the main sources of students from outside of Europe. In terms of percentages, the Netherlands, Austria, Ireland and the UK have the highest percentage of foreign students in their own country, whether they be coming from um, outside of Europe or within Europe itself. That's just a, a very quick schematic map there of the mobility patterns across Europe. As you see, there's big red lines going to three different, big lines going to three countries, the UK, France and Germany being major destinations for researchers, for PhD students, from, 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 both from, from around Europe. If you look at international mobility out of Europe, um, the major destination for um, researchers is the United States. Australia, Canada, New Zealand. In fact, in the Marie Curie programme, in the outgoing international fellowships, I think 96 or 97 percent of all the people who've gone through that system have gone to the United States. Transferable skills training. This is a great one about, uh, that, that, that people talk about again and again and again, of giving PhD students the opportunities to acquire skills either in their own disciplines or in more generic skills in areas of leadership, communication, project management, etc., as part of their PhD, but also part of their employment prospects afterwards. However, the one thing is that while 50% of people say they have received training, the training is relatively short. Much of it is in communication skills, very little in entrepreneurial skills. In fact, only 40, only 10% of doctoral candidates report on receiving training in areas of intellectual property and entrepreneurial skills. So these are areas that, would, that, that really one would see would need to be improved. Again, there's some more details there in that, but I'll go straight on to the next one, the seventh and final um, part of the seven principles. And this is the quality assurance of the PhD life cycle. And it's about the structure, how the PhD is organized. I mean, in the past, people would often write to a lab. They get a professor to write back and say, yes, come to me, go to the lab, spend three or four years there, and then leave. The new concept around the PhD is to have something far more organized, both in terms of recruitment, to ensure there's a very open recruitment of PhD candidates, to ensure that you bring as many in as possible, that each student is treated as an individual, their training needs are met individually rather than as part of a larger cohort because one's got to remember that students coming from different countries, 
as graduates to do a PhD actually have very different qualifications and cannot and should not be treated the same. To manage the progression of the PhD student very well, to support career planning, to at graduation, in some cases now, in addition to the PhD, there is a thesis supplement. Now, this, is a, this is not part of the examination of the PhD, but is valuable for the student because it gives them an accreditation for any courses they have completed as part of their training. And career tracking. It's something which is significantly lacking and something which the US has done very well through the National Science Foundation. I think this is something which is, uh, is, is done well in Marie Curie specifically, but needs to be broadened right across Europe. I, I'm going to skip some examples here because I want to go on to um, the policy objective, which is the doctorate in Europe. Going back over those seven principles, we believe that this aspiration for all students to have this kind of experience is really important. It is about creating a system in Europe where one can say that if you go to an institution, of course things will be different specifically locally, but you know that you are going to an institution which is saying, we support the seven principles. We will, in, we, will, we will give you the best working environment. We will ensure that we give you a quality assurance around the life cycle of your PhD. We will give you opportunities for international networking, for placements in industry, for opportunities for interdisciplinarity. It will be different more or less in, di in different organisations, but it's important that the principles are always applied. Now, what are the obstacles? The first one I call sleepwalking. I know. Daniel has kindly pointed out I'm just on time. Sleepwalking is the students. Students often walk in completely blind to a PhD without even thinking what they're doing. I've got a master's, I've got this, I'll do a PhD. And they don't think about what is their objective. I like doing research, that's great, but why are you doing it? What are you going to do when you complete? Where are you going to go? It's really thinking about what you're doing. It's part of the European Charter. It's about the responsibilities of researchers in addition to their rights. It's about the life cycle of the PhD. The students don't come in blind. They come in in a structured way. Our funding models actually do have a two-tier system. Marie Curie funding gives you very good funding for structured PhDs where students are well looked after, as indeed many national systems, the graduate college system in Germany, um, UK systems, etc. But you have many projects where, people, where students are simply, let's say, their lab fodder. They're there simply to carry out a small piece of work in the lab and go away very quickly and not bother anybody. So I think there, there is a two-tier system which needs, to, which needs to be addressed. There is still the dominance of the academic apprenticeship and there is a lack of employment opportunities for students, for graduates, outside of academia, which needs to be addressed as well. But what can influence progress? The new commission. There is a new commission, remember, with a new focus in terms of jobs and economic growth. Government agencies, universities themselves and how they reorganise their structures. Relevant organisations like Eurodoc and the Voice of the Researcher. And indeed, the Mary Slodowska Curie doctoral schemes, which I think can act as a paradigm or a model for others to act on. You may say, many may say, that we don't have the money to implement the principles of doctoral training. You don't, it's not always about money, a lot of it's about organisation. So even with the lack of funding, you can still do an awful lot towards respecting and implementing those principles. And hopefully in a number of years, we'll have a brand, let's say, or a, or a system that people can call the doctorate in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Connor. You gave us uh, material for discussing for the next two days, so we should cancel the conference <laughs> at this point. <laughs> okay, so we move to the last speaker of the session, Dr. Sarah, Sarah Giesen. From, G, uh, from GFK that stays from Agency for Growth for, from Knowledge. Please. Thank you. I will uh, present a study for you that we conducted in 2013. It was commissioned by DGAAC from the European Commission and it was uh, conducted uh, by the consortium consisting of uh, Italian uh, agency, Economisti Associati, GFK and which is an uh, international uh, agency and then a German uh, a research agency, Fraunhofer EC. 
Um, the main objective of this study was to map the long-term career development of former Marie Curie fellows. And it consists of a uh, number of uh, aspects we explored more in depthly. So we mapped the career paths of these former fellows. Uh, we compared their career paths with um, researchers, which we uh, defined as the control group. So that were researchers which, who did not undertake uh, a Marie Curie fellowship. But the uh, majority of them um, took part in another kind of, another type of fellowship or did no uh, fellowship at all. Um, the study consists of three main activities. So we conducted a survey of um, Marie Curie fellows and a control group. This survey was conducted online and was quantitative in nature. Uh, we also uh, enriched this quantitative data with um, uh, interviews which we conducted with former fellows, with their hosts and also stakeholders on European level. So it was nearly 100 interviews were conducted, and that was very valuable data to um, relate back to the quantitative findings. And then a third main activity was a bibliometric analysis, uh, which served two goals. On the one hand, it helped us building the sample of uh, former fellows, former Marie Curie fellows, and the control group uh, researchers. But also, um, it gave us opportunity to look uh, very profoundly at the productivity of researchers in both groups, and also it we could determine the quality of their outputs and also to a certain extent to what, uh, to which level these uh, uh, articles, books, monographs uh, were published uh, based on international collaboration. And I will now uh, um, go and present uh, the main findings of this study. It's a very uh, rich study, there are uh, numerous uh, interesting uh, findings there. It is published, so on the website of the European Commission you can find the full report. So, uh, brief overview of the sample of both the Marie Curie researchers in our study and the control group. As you can see, um, in terms of um, uh, gender, uh, the minority were in both groups uh, female, so around 30 percent. Majority, the vast majority in both uh, samples had uh, obtained their doctoral degree. Um, the sample amongst uh, the sample of the former Marie Curie fellows was slightly younger. 80% was below 45 years old, while this was only 49% in the uh, control group sample. And is mainly due uh, to the fact that we limited uh, our uh, sample of former Marie Curie fellows to those who um, did their fellowship, their Marie Curie fellowship, under FP4 until FP6. So we did not include those under FP7. So that's why uh, we had a limitation there. And that's, this also explained to a certain extent the difference in age, and you will also see in terms of research experience. In both groups, you can see that also, again, the majority um, obtained their uh, PhD in natural sciences, 75% versus 65% in the control group. On second place, we have engineering and technology. And then on the third place, amongst the former Marie Curie uh, fellows, we have the social sciences, while this is medical sciences in the control group. Um, in terms of um, the, let's say, the uh, reputation and the ranking of the university, so the level of, of affili affiliation where they obtained their uh, PhD, you can see that it's also quite similar between uh, both groups. So 24 obtained, 24% uh, obtained their PhD at the top 100 university based on the uh, World Times uh, ranking of universities. And this was 22% in the control group sample. And there you, if we look at uh, research experience, again, there you see a a bit of a, a, a discrepancy between both groups. So where we have um, a more homogeneous sample amongst the former Marie Curie fellows with 60% having a research experience between 11 and 20 years old. This is only 30% in the control group, but actually they cover a wider range. So we had more uh, researchers with uh, a lower uh, or um, less research experience, but also on the other side. So uh, more researchers with a longer career. In terms of uh, citizenship, as you can see, uh, the bigger countries or European countries are uh, on top. So we have uh, Italy in both, on both, in both groups on the top, France, Spain, and Germany, and then to a lesser extent, uh, British uh, uh, fellows or researchers in our study. 
And let's <coughs> have a look at the uh, findings now. I will skip this. This will take too long. It's in the report described very extensively. This is an analytical framework uh, we used to assess um, the impact of fellowships and more in particular Marie Curie fellowships on the career development. Uh, we looked at a wide variety of dependent variables or, or let's say outcomes or um, aspects in their career, um, tra uh, career uh, trajectory. Um, and here we looked and we asked um, all the researchers to assess to what extent um, their fellowship they undertook, whether, in the, of course, for the Marie Curie researchers, we asked them to focus on their Marie Curie fellowships. The other, um, in the control group, they focused on the other type of fellowship they, un they had undertaken. And we asked them to what extent this was, um, their fellowship contributed to um, career drivers, um, so to what extent this was a fulfillment of um, aspects um, that helped them to proceed in their career. And you can see this is indicated in green, um, so it was on a 10-point scale that uh, um, average scores in the, uh, former Marie Curie, amongst the former Marie Curie fellows is higher than uh, compared to the other um, researchers in the control group. Um, Especially three aspects uh, rate, were rated or assessed very high. So we have, um, so amongst the former Marie Curie fellows, um, they said that um, especially having access to high quality research facilities and laboratories um, um, was, a, was an asset of their, of their fellowship and it contributed to their career. Um, the same holds for their international mobility experience, which is no surprise, this is a key feature of the Marie Curie actions but also the development of a strong and widespread research network um, they assessed um, as uh, highly contributing to their career progress and also that it was because of the, of, or at least that their uh, Marie Curie Fellowship contributed to this. In terms of uh, mobility, because we explored mobility uh, according to three dimensions, geographical mobility, sectoral mobility and interdisciplinarity. Um, Relating to sectoral mobility, uh, we see when we compare both groups that their former Marie Curie fellows experience a slightly uh, higher cross-sectoral mobility in their career. So um, good to know here is that we um, defined um, six sectors, academic sector, the uh, sector with the public sector, employer, um, research labs and um, research institutes, either private or semi-public the non-for-profit sector and then uh, private sector where we distinguished SMEs and the larger enterprises. Um, so our former Marie Curie fellows reported that they had uh, worked during their career um, in more than, uh, to a higher extent than compared to the control group in more than uh, one uh, sector. When it comes to um, moving um, from one sector to another sector um, before and after the fellowship, um, then actually this proportion is rather low, um, especially when you look at pr uh, public versus private. So there is the proportion is very, very low of those who, uh, who moved from one to the other sector. If we focus on the Marie Curie fellows, um, then we see that actually um, if we compare before and after the fellowship, that um, there is mainly a movement from academia to the other. Um, sectors to the private enterprises and to sectors uh, which are which consist of the research research labs or the non-for-profit organizations. Uh, when it comes to multi or interdisciplinarity, uh, we see then when we compare both groups that actually the um, Marie, Marie Curie fellows are less likely to change discipline after their um, fellowship compared to the control group. But they reported that actually because of the fellowship they were more effective in developing interdisciplinary skills. And again they uh, said that their fellowship contributed highly to this. So they were more positive on the fellowship uh, when it comes to developing their inter interdisciplinary skills. But when it comes to moving or broadening their um, disciplines or their research fields, this was uh, to a lesser extent than when compared to the uh, control group. In terms of uh, internationalization of their career, we, we saw that uh, former Marie Curie fellows worked in more countries, that they also settled more frequently abroad. Uh, in this respect, uh, Italy was really the top country where um, 
the vast majority of the researchers in our sample, the former Marie Curie uh, researchers, um, have moved to another country and are now working in another country. While you, when you compare it to the um, Italian researchers in the control group, this was to a much lesser extent. The same, but also to a lesser extent, is true for um, um, the UK. Uh, and then we see, for example, in countries like France and Spain that there, uh, there is no real difference between um, the former Marie Curie fellows and the control group. So Italy is really the country where uh, uh, the researchers move out and, and also settle abroad and work for uh, uh, an employer in another country. They also said the former Marie Curie fellows also reported to uh, collaborate more frequently on joint international co publications. So it was um, based on what they uh, reported in our survey, but we also saw that when we uh, conducted the bibliometric analysis. When it comes to establishing and building a professional network, uh, there the Marie Curie fellows reported to have smaller networks. So on average between 11 and 50 people they met and with whom they worked while in the uh, control group these networks were reported to be bigger, larger, but um, actually they were stronger amongst the former Marie Curie fellows because they, uh, to a higher extent, they continued this collaboration. So they continued um, pu uh, publishing together, um, setting up joint research projects and so on. So that was uh, uh, a, a very clear uh, distinction. Uh, when we look uh, at the employability of, uh, of uh, fellows after their fellowship, then we see that um, there was an improved um, short-term employ employability. So uh, if we compare um, their uh, employment status before and after the fellowship, then we see that uh, more fellows obtained a position after they conducted the fellowship, and this was also um, um, a difference with the with, um, control group where we, where we saw that actually short-term employability was a bit lower. Um, and also in terms of uh, the type of contract, we saw that um, the former Marie Curie fellows have a higher chance of uh, obtaining a permanent position after their fellowship compared to the other um, researchers in the control group. They were also more likely to be retained by their hosts, especially after long fellowships. And long fellowships we defined as more than two years, because we saw that on average um, the fellowships they undertook lasted for two years. In terms of career speed, uh, we saw some mild short-term effects, especially for the knowledge-intensive fellowships. And uh, with um, with this, we actually um, looked at to what extent they moved to a more senior position and, and to what extent they obtained more uh, responsibilities immediately after their fellowship. And we saw there that uh, amongst uh, this was um, more the case or to a, to a higher extent amongst uh, uh, former Marie Curie fellows when compared to the control group. On the other hand, uh, when we looked at uh, what we could call midterm and long-term um, um, career um, achievements, we saw that actually um, in the group of the former Marie Curie fellows, um, there was a high proportion who in the end obtained uh, a professorship title or appointment. So there was a larger group of them amongst uh, former Marie Curie fellows compared to the control group, but it took them longer. And um, to a certain extent, we think that we can explain this by the fact that um, the former Marie Curie fellows are much more or ha have been much more mobile than con the control group. And maybe when you, when you keep on working at the same university or at the same um, employer, it is easier or it's, you will become sooner or you will reach sooner or achieve sooner um, a certain position such as a professorship. So uh, it took our former Marie Curie fellows a bit longer than compared to the, to the control group. Uh, in terms of professional output, we see that um, when it comes to publications, they publish slightly uh, more than compared to the control group. They have a higher age index cit or uh, citation index, um, journal impact factor, the average journal impact factor when we would uh, calculate all the, the journals in which they publish together. We see that also this is higher amongst the former, slightly higher. So these are no real big differences. We see that there are differences. They are statistically significant, but uh, <laughs> they are not that big. Um, 
And we also saw, but also to a very limited extent, um, that they publish more books and monographs compared to the control group. On the other hand, <clears throat> when we look at um, patents uh, that have been filed or commercialized, we saw that uh, the former Marie Curie fellows do that to a lesser extent than compared to the control group. Also in terms of uh, enterprises or businesses they have started up, this was also lower than compared to the control group. But again, we are talking about very small numbers here. In terms of uh, participating in, to, in uh, international conferences as, as presenter, as speaker uh, or keynote speaker, we saw that it was a great participation of young uh, Marie Curie fellows, because we took age, of course, there as a control variable. With young, uh, we have defined those who are under 35 years old. And we also saw that, uh, again, for the young uh, fellows, so under 35 years, that they have obtained a higher number of scientific prizes and awards when compared to the control group. In terms of uh, access to research funds, um, we see that the former Marie Curie fellows, so that means after their fellowship, um, there's a higher percentage that obtained research funds, um, especially national grants, but also in ERC grants, which you see here. On the other hand, amongst the control group, they were um, more successful in obtaining private funding after their fellowship, which you see here. Employment status and conditions. <clears throat> so if we compare the current, their current situation, then we see that actually the former Marie Curie fellows are more often employed with more stable contracts. Also more frequently, uh, they are employed by top 100 uh, university or higher education institutes, again, based on the World Times ranking. We didn't see a significant impact on income. Um, so we did not observe that uh, one of both groups earn more. And of course, we took into account um, the differences between uh, countries in Europe. So we used uh, um, purchase power parity figures uh, to um, account for that. But if we, because that was also asked in the survey, if we ask them about how did your salary and, or your income grow over the years during your career, then we saw that uh, amongst the former Marie Curie fellows, they reported um, a higher growth than compared to the control group. Um, more likely, um, they are still in research, so that's 93% in our sample of uh, former Marie Curie fellows are still in research. This is 88% amongst the control group. They are more likely to lead a research team, although that team is smaller than compared to control group researchers who are leading a team. And they are more likely, but I already explained that, or mentioned that they are more likely uh, holding a title of associate professor or full professor. We also asked them about their satisfaction with their current job. And there we see also um, differences with the control group on all uh, in general, but also on all different aspects of satisfaction. Uh, we saw that our former Marie Curie fellows um, report higher satisfaction levels. Um, so it's 16% higher when we ask them about in general, how satisfied are you with your current job? Um, and it was uh, especially, the, uh, the difference was especially there for um, uh, satisfaction with progress opportunities, job benefits, um, resources for research, location of the job, uh, job security, working conditions, and status and prestige. So higher levels of satisfaction amongst the former Marie Curie fellows. We also explained, I will be short on this, there's a lot uh, of interesting um, findings there, and, and, and it also would require more deeper level um, um, studying what is in there. So I will only present the key findings here. So we also explored to what extent, um, what are the current differences between male and female researchers, and to what extent it is different for former uh, Marie Curie fellows. So we uh, looked on the one hand, all the female, we we looked at all the female researchers in both samples, compared them with their uh, male counterparts, and then we also um, compared the uh, female researchers uh, who did a Marie Curie fellowship with those who did, with female researchers who did another type of fellowship. Um, when we look, uh, when we compare the, the males versus the female researchers, then we see that uh, women report far more frequent career breaks than men, uh, which is not surprisingly, especially if you know that the main reason for the career break is, a ma is maternity leave. 
Uh, women also experience to have more frequently um, um, conflicts when trying to find the balance between their private and their professional life. Um, so you see here, um, if we then ask them, and, and to what extent were you able to reconcile both, then we see also that men were, more, there was a higher proportion of men who said, or reported, uh, yes, it was able to reconcile both, to find the balance. This is to a lesser extent true for the females. Female uh, researchers also report to a higher extent that they, when they had to choose between one or the other, that they played down their career. So that you see here for these uh, yellow marked proportions. Um, we also asked them about their experience with discrimination. And overall, one third of the female researchers um, suffered some kind of discrimination. Uh, this is lower among the young researchers, so below the 35 years old, and maybe that has to do to do by, uh, that's due to the fact that maybe if you're older and look back on your career that you have, uh, that you become more aware of things that you could relate back to, to potential discrimination. <clears throat> when we compare um, Marie Curie fellows with um, control group, we see that in terms of discrimination, this was only uh, marginally lower in, uh, amongst the former Marie Curie fellows, female fellows. Types of discrimination, um, the most frequent type of discrimination and also the one that was rated as very severely uh, according to, to our female researchers is um, when it comes to job qualifications and conditions where they report that actually their uh, male counterparts with the same level of experience, the same level of skills were uh, actually uh, obtained more easily um, higher ranking positions and also a higher salary. Um, in terms of employability and career progress, it was reported less often, but also they find it uh, there was a very strong um, type of discrimination, uh, very severe for uh, the female researchers, is when, when they had the feeling or when they were, it not only, was not only the feeling, but it was sometimes uh, mentioned very explicitly to them that uh, potential employers were a bit reluctant to hire them because they may have children um, or they have already children and employers may fear that they would also uh, devote too much time to the children and that it would have a negative effect on, on their career and the time they could devote to the, devote to the job. We also asked them about uh, gender-based misconducts. Um, these cases were reported, uh, but l much less severe. Um, and if we ask them, and what, what, what exactly was it, um, then they refer to things like, okay, I was the one, because I was working in a team with all male, fe with, uh, male uh, researchers, and I was one because I was the only female researcher who had to go for the coffee and bring the coffee and things like that. So they don't rate it very severely, but still they, they, they reported that it was for them a type of discrimination, of course, which they did not like. Um, looking at the career effects, then we see actually amongst the former Marie Curie fellows um, that um, after, immediately after the fellowship, actually that the female, it's 31% against 27 amongst the male uh, researchers, became employed. Um, but if we then look at um, type of contract and also the um, uh, what kind of position, then we see that uh, again the male researchers, high percent proportion of them um, got a permanent contract uh, after the fellowship and also uh, more higher proportion, although it's not a big difference, uh, moved to a more senior position. Um, in terms of uh, scientific output, uh, those are marked, which are marked in red, there we saw a difference between the male and the female researchers where especially, or and it's for, for all of those aspects the same, where uh, we saw, for example, that uh, the productivity of female researchers was lower, the patent submitted was lower, uh, invitation as a keynote speaker was lower, access to research funds was lower. Uh, the only thing where we did not see the, a difference was when it, come to, when it came to the journal impact factor. So on the one hand, you can see it as a positive aspect that these female researchers have published uh, maybe less, but the quality is good because uh, in terms of general impact factor, this, we didn't see any or didn't observe any uh, difference. We then looked at to what extent we saw differences between the, the former female uh, or the female researchers who did Marie Curie fellowship 
uh, compared to the female researchers in the control group. And we saw that for some of these um, outputs that there was um, the difference or that actually um, there was a um, smaller difference within the former Marie Curie fellows, uh, amongst the former Marie Curie fellows. This was true, for example, uh, when we looked at the articles they published. Um, it was also true for the citation index. Um, and it was also true for access to research funds. So we saw that there, um, actually, the Marie Curie Fellowship was a very, very positive influence for the uh, female researchers. <clears throat> I will now move on quickly because only two minutes left. One, One now. Uh, <laughs> Okay, actually overall the same story uh, when we look at employment status and conditions and uh, also t aspects such as income level, uh, we see that um, type of position, um, uh, the, uh, the income level that is lower amongst the female uh, researchers uh, when compared to their male counterparts. Very quickly, conclusions. What we saw on the basis of this study is that the Marie Curie fellowships do have uh, beneficial effect, effects on improving fellows' career prospects and their achievements. Uh, uh, the Marie Curie fellowships enjoy a very uh, positive, highly positive reputation. Um, they, they are able to, uh, through the actions, we are able to attract talented EU uh, researchers uh, which were educated in prestigious universities. Um, also, the degree of affiliation of former fellows remains high, even in the long term. But if we look at the differences in terms of, for example, output and, and, and other up, uh, types of outcomes, then we see that there are difference, positive differences when we talk about the Marie Curie fellowships, but they are small. Uh, possible reasons for this uh, may be that the career benefits may take a bit longer to fully materialize. And remember when I was talking about the sample, um, composition that we had a, um, a group in the, amongst the former Marie Curie sample uh, with um, a sh small, um, shorter career than compared to the um, control group because we limited them to only FP426. Um, in terms of the gender gap, as uh, you could also there you could have seen, um, there is still a gender gap, um, but we see that in terms of uh, certain aspects that um, these uh, Marie Curie fellowships were able to mitigate uh, this gap to a certain extent. And I uh, will leave it <laughs> from here. Thank you also for staying on time. So uh, at this point, we don't have time for further questions because we have to move to the next session. But I think that this keynote uh, session was very uh, interesting and useful to set uh, the discussion for the next two days. So I would like with you to thank all the speakers once more. <laughs> and move to the next session. Um, for, the, for the prize ceremony, could I please ask um, some people to join me here up on the uh, platform? Thank you. Um, could I ask, please, uh, Director General Prats Monet to come to, to the platform, um, and also uh, Minister uh, Giannini, and also Regional President um, Rossi, and also Professor Massimiano Bucchi, please.
We sit at the back. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So we should sit from here. Yes. Do you have a microphone? Ah, good. And me, that's fine. Yeah. So. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Mr. Rossi? Yeah, pleased to meet you. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Paul Harris from the European Commission. I'm very pleased to uh, moderate this uh, uh, awards presentation ceremony for the Murray School of Curie Actions Prizes 2014. Um, just to, to tell you how it will, will work, we have three prize categories, three winners, and we will go through each uh, in turn. And I, I will call um, firstly on uh, the judges from each category to say something about the winners. Then I will ask uh, each winner to come up to the podium to receive uh, a certificate, uh, a trophy, uh, and a memento from the presidency. And uh, uh, as you see on the, here on the panel, we've been joined by uh, not only Minister Giannini, uh, Director General Prats Monet, but also um, uh, Regional President uh, Mr. Mr. Rossi. So uh, that will be the, the, these people will be presenting the the, the prize uh, certificates and trophies. Um, the fellows themselves, the winners, will actually speak uh, after this. There will be directly a press conference. So we will hear during the press conference from, from the winners briefly. And tonight, each of the three winners will give a full presentation at the gala dinner, which we are looking forward to, to, to very much. So um, to start, please, I would like to ask um, Professor Massimiano Bucchi um, to talk uh, about the winner of the Communicating Science Prize. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shane Bergin is the winner of the Communicating Science Prize. There were 82 applications for this prize and the shortlist was considered by three judges. Professor Bjorn Schumacher, I think he's here with us today, Dr. Claire Belker and myself, Massimiano Bucchi. Shane is a senior research fellow at Trinity College Dublin, Ireland. He works in the School of Physics and the Center for Research on Adaptive Nanostructures and Nano Devices. And between 2009 and 2012, he undertook an MSCA fellowship at the University College London in the UK. One aspect of his research is in low dimensional nanomaterials to realize the potential of these materials in composites and applications. He's also an expert on innovations in the teaching of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM subjects. Shane collaborates with the School of Education at this university and uh, his initiative, Dart of Physics, which he founded and managed in 2013, uh, was very successful. This initiative involved placing posters on the main public transport system in Dublin, and these had statements related to physics, encouraging the public to learn more via a special website. It was a great success and will shortly be replicated on the London, London Underground. Thank you. And now I'd like to pass the word to Professor Bjorn Schumacher, also a judge uh, for this prize. He's from uh, uh, the uh, Research Center in uh, Germany. What really uh, struck us as uh, the jury was the creativity and also the organizational skills that allowed uh, Shane to uh, attract funding for the project, for the Data Physics project. Um, and uh, recruit with that graphic designers and advertisers to really bring science into the everyday lives of the Dublin commuters. Um, his uh, project got really widespread attention both in the, in the uh, social media as well as uh, in media outlets and um, he particularly is not only a, an outstanding communicator but also his science was really featured in many uh, newspapers and news outlets internationally including the Wall Street Journal and uh, um, big weeklies like the Spiegel in Germany and all over the world really. Um, he got recently about two million YouTube clicks on a video um, that showed in about a 27 second clip um, the drop of pitch which uh, takes actually years to um, uh, to occur and so he's really brought the science uh, to every to ordinary people's life and every day. Thank you very much and can I now in invite uh, Dr. Shane Birkin to come to the podium to receive the prize. Thank you very much.
Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today to receive uh, this award for my research in science communication. I am particularly uh, happy that it's coming from the European Commission as they've been a strong supporter of my research at, at every level. Um, you'll hear a little more from me this evening about the project Data Physics, but in a nutshell, I, I, I invented uh, a style of science communication to try and engage with every member of the Dublin community um, from all socio-economic backgrounds, um, all age groups, both genders, and uh, we wanted to spark a city-wide conversation about science, particularly about physics, because I think it's beautiful, and I think that uh, the, ent the entire world should think it's beautiful too. So um, thank you very much, and thank you very much to the Minister and to the Director uh, General uh, for uh, awarding uh, this to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, thank you very much. I think there's a, a, a further, a further award. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, and also to our jury members. Thank you. If you could uh, uh, move down, and we'll pass to the next prize category award. Thank you very much. So. Um, we now repeat the process, but for the next two prize winners, uh, yes, perhaps if, for, or you, if you want to stand, it's, it's absolutely fine. It's quite short uh, uh, speeches. So um, next then, please, could I ask uh, for the Promising Research Talent Prize, uh, Dr. Gikas uh, Magiokinis to, to join us to talk about the winner, and also uh, Professor Maria Cristina uh, Pedicchio. Um, so it is a great pleasure to announce that Dr. Manasar Agavan is the winner of the Promising Research Talent Prize. There were 70 applications for this prize and the shortlist was considered by three judges. Professor Maya Schuldiner from the Wiseman Institute of Science Israel. Professor Maria Cristina Pedicchio and uh, me. Uh, Manasa is a Canadian molecular biologist interested in human genomics. In 2011, she obtained her PhD at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, funded by Marie Sklodowska Curie Action Fellowships, and has since been a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Geogenetics. She is primarily working on resolving aspects of the peopling of the Americas by making use of genome scale data from ancient and modern humans. Indeed, she is combining genomics with archaeology, one of many examples in which the Maris Klodowska Curie Actions funds interdisciplinary science. Thank you. So, to say something more about the motivation that brought us to this decision. So we noticed that uh, Manha's achievements uh, are really incredibly high, mainly as lead author of articles published in uh, highly reputed journals like Nature and Science. In fact, one of these studies revealed dual origins for Native Americans using a 24,000 years old modern human genome of a Siberian boy. Another very interesting publication covered the largest population level paleogenomic study published so far, looking at the genetic prehistory of the North American Arctic. Despite her young age and having recently completed the PhD, she is clearly well recognized in her field already. For example, she received an Archaeological Research Prize award by the University of Oxford earlier in her career. Other strengths in Manasa's CV that caught our attention were her sole authorship of a book chapter 
and her teaching record, both as a lecturer and as a supervisor. So we really congratulate with her. I would also use this opportunity to thank the Commission for offering the opportunity to be part of the jury. As a colleague said, uh, we had the opportunity to look at uh, many curricula and to many interesting motivation letters. So we are sure that we have an incredibly alive researcher community, strong, and this is another great result of Marie Curie actions. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And can I invite Manasseh to come forward, please? Please, Manasa and uh, our colleagues will present you with a certificate and uh, a trophy and uh, a memento. <laughs> and also uh, some other. Would you like to say anything briefly or just? <laughs> yes, oh, oh, thank you very much. It's very kind. Um, so uh, just a few quick words. Uh, I'd like to thank the European Commission, um, the organizers and the jury members for this honor. Um, I'm extremely honored um, to be here to accept this award and I look forward to sharing my research with you this evening. Um, and I also take this opportunity to congratulate the fellow winners and all the finalists. Um, so thank you. Congratulations. Thank, you very thank you very much to our jury members as well and thank you. Okay. And so we move to the to the final uh, thank you Debbie, yeah. to the final uh, category of our prize which is nurturing research uh, talents. Um, could I ask Professor Roberto Battiston to, to join us? If, yes. Thank you, Professor. Okay. So, the winner of the Nutrient Research Talent Prize is uh, Dr. Sara Bondiek. Uh, there were 56 applications for this prize, and the shortlist was considered by three judges, Professor Maria Resigno of the European Institute of Oncology in Italy, myself, and Professor Wolfgang Schroeder, Vice President of the Council of Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings. Sarah is a lecturer in biomedical physics at the University of Cambridge, UK. She's also group leader at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. Her research uses novel imaging, imaging techniques to explore the molecular processes in living systems. She currently holds an MCACA Cancer Career Integration Grant that enabled her to return to Europe from their previous position at Stanford University School of Medicine in U USA. The MSCA grant partially finances two of the six researchers within the group of Sarah Leeds. Her previous mentoring experience includes support to a postdoctoral fellow and three PhD candidates. In awarding Sarah this prize, the jury highlighted that she was recently awarded the Science Heirloom by the UK Medical Research Council. That honor not only recognized her world-leading research, but specifically her generosity in supporting and mentoring younger scientists and students. In particular, she dedicated part of her time to being training coordinator for cancer imaging specialists. These include developing projects for school pupils on her own initiatives. Sarah does all this in addition to her regular lecturing at the university, which is imaginative and popular. Sarah highly impressed the judges not only by the excelling in all the selection criteria for the Nurturing Research Talent Prize, but also as a clear role model for engaging women in science. Sarah has given speeches at events on this theme and also leads webinars for school pupils and part as part of the STEMET program for girls aiming at careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. Therefore, despite her young age, Sarah has already as many achievements to her name in science, mentoring, and outreach. Welcome. Thank you. Sarah, please come forward.
Thank you very much. It's a real honour to be able to accept this award today, and I'd like to thank the judges and the European Commission for considering me for the, um, for the award. So we had some interesting talks this morning about um, how we can facilitate researchers and empower them and really train the next generation, and particularly Connor highlighted how we can do that for PhD students. So one particular thing I'd like to highlight is how we as individuals have a responsibility to nurture and to represent and to guide and to train the next generation of PhD students, but also high school students, undergraduates, and guiding them into scientific careers. And I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for some really strong mentors of mine who have championed me throughout my career. So I'd also like to thank everyone who's helped and guided me to get to this position today. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Well, thank you very much to all of our jury members, firstly, uh, not just to those who are present today, but to who, who really worked very hard. It was a very difficult uh, d decision to make, and uh, they, they've really given of their time most generously. Thank you very much to, uh, to our Italian colleagues for their participation in the prize uh, process and indeed in the, in the ceremony. I think now there's g we're going to uh, commence a press conference in... Sorry? <laughs> ah, I'm sorry, there's something further. <laughs> Today is, it's, it's a special day, not only for this event, but because today it's the birthday of uh, <laughs> our minister. <laughs> as, a small gift. Thank you. Thank you. Strictly confidential. Oh, thank you so much. I try to 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 neglect the. It happens once a day. It uh, once a year. It, uh, it happens. Well, uh, let me say that being here and celebrating the best of Europe today is the best way for me to to celebrate also <laughs> my anniversary. So thanks a lot to Mr. President and to Director General to all of you for being here in, for this very, very important shared objective. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, in fact, um, so just to, to announce now that there will be a press conference starting in about uh, five minutes' time. You're very welcome to stay for the press conference, uh, which will include our, our winners. Um, but if you do stay, could you please be very quiet, because, of course, there's uh, recording equipment and so forth. If not, you are very welcome to, to move out to, to, to the lunch area. But uh, we will start the press conference in uh, uh, five minutes or so. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We will start the press conference. Um, so here on stage you have the three winners, Mana Sarah Gavan for Promising Research Talent, Sarah Bondink for Nurturing Research Talent, Shane Bergin for Communicating Science, and you have Hugo Rossi, uh, Minister Giannini, and Xavier Prats Monet if you have also some questions for them. Um, so first we will start with a two, three minutes presentation from each winner, and we will go in the same order, and then we will have your questions. Manasa. So again, I want to thank um, the European Commission, the organizers, and uh, the jury members for presenting me with this honor. And I've been very lucky to be part of the Marie Curie FP7, um, the, P the ITN framework, where I was a PhD student, um, and I did my PhD in University of Copenhagen. And I'm originally a Canadian, and what really attracted me to Copenhagen and the program in particular was the multidisciplinary aspect of the project. So I'm a molecular biologist by training, and what this project offered was for me to bring my skills as a molecular biologist, my wet lab skills, to apply it to archaeological questions, questions about human evolution, about human migrations, about trying to solve, basically, the patterns of, of modern-day genetic genetic diversity that's um, um, evident in modern populations. And in particular, I focused my PhD project on the peopling of the Americas, so that's basically the continent of North America, South America, including the Arctic um, areas, which included Greenland and also parts of Siberia. Um, and we had some very fascinating results, and a lot of this was possible because of, of new technology, new next generation sequencing techniques, um, which was sort of part of the skill set that I picked up. And I look forward to summarizing these results this evening uh, for you all at the gala dinner. Um, and again, thank you for, for having me here. Thank you. Sarah, can you please now present your, <laughs> your research? Hi, so um, thanks very much for listening and um, thanks again to the European Commission for the honour of this award. So I'm a physicist by training and I transferred over the course of my postdoctoral fellowships into uh, cancer biology. And I now work at the interface where I'm actually directly appointed 50% in a physics department and 50% in a cancer research department. And what I'm doing there is trying to develop uh, new instruments which allow us to provide non-invasive images of tumors and study how the tumor evolves early in its um, development and also how it becomes drug resistant when we treat it with chemotherapy. And my research lab actually spans all the way from studying um, cancer in single cells in dishes all the way through to translational research applied to um, optical imaging in humans. So we are really trying to push the translational barrier and take some of these new basic developments from areas such as nanophotonics and telecommunications and package them in medical imaging systems such that we can then apply them and use them to try and help earlier diagnosis of cancer. So that's the area that my research focuses on and I'm really a, a big proponent of um, scientific mentoring and trying to improve the way that um, established group leaders and professors interact with their PhD students and their trainees such that we can uh, empower the next generation of researchers to really fulfill their career ambitions and I'm really trying to make a change of this by being a training coordinator as part of one of the UK-wide initiatives in cancer imaging and also more locally within my own university. So thanks once again for listening and I look forward to telling you more about both my research and my efforts in trying to train the next generation at the gala dinner this evening. Um, I think I'm next. Um, my, my name is Shane Bergen and I'm from Trinity College in Dublin and um, I'm delighted to receive the award for um, my efforts in communicating science. I think it's very clear that we live in a knowledge, or in, uh, a knowledge economy but I don't want to live in a knowledge economy. I want to live in a knowledge society and I think there are huge economic benefits from the exploitation of science research but we need that to apply to people and to citizens. And so I, I want to change the perception that people have about science and particularly about physics, my own area. So I invented a campaign called Darta Physics to do that. And I decided I would take a place where everybody goes, the metro, the train. Everybody takes the journey on the train in the morning, whether you're very rich or not so rich, um, all ages. And I put on the train these interactive statements about physics, saying things like, 
we are all made from stardust. I think that's amazing. Or that the moon is escaping the earth. Um, you could put one in Paris saying the Eiffel Tower is, is shorter in the winter than it is in the summer. That's true. Um, these things spark the curiosities of, of commuters. And then I, I encouraged commuters to make the transition to our website that I designed with colleagues in the schools of education and also with graphic designers and advertisers in Dublin in order for those people to talk about physics. I don't want to be lecturing them or telling them because so much about science is the process of discovery rather than it just being a large body of fact. I wanted people to play with it and to contextualize it for their own lives, for making it relevant for them so that they would discover. Basically, what I wanted to do is for a mum or a dad or uh, a son or daughter to go home and say, hey, I saw on the train today that if you take the dart, time slows down. You know, um, and uh, for them to be amazed by that statement and then want to go and learn as opposed to feeling, oh, I have to go and learn. Um, so. I sparked a citywide conversation to capture the beauty of science. And I hope in turn that it will lead to people being more engaged with it and being, being more playful with it of all generations so that people really can move towards living in a knowledge-based society. Thank you. Any questions from the press or reaction from the minister? or? President or DG? Maybe uh, very are simple shocked. reaction to <laughs> these uh, fantastic words I heard in the last speech, but uh, all of you uh, talked about the, the importance of this uh, connection between uh, knowledge, science, and society. I think that the last effort you have to do as a uh, scientific community, you belong to, I uh, do belong to in my real life but also as politicians is try to, to make this effort a concrete planning for the future of Europe and all our countries. So I think that uh, also so-called ordinary people can realize the importance of the, uh, the applications of uh, basic curiosi curiosity-driven science uh, in their daily lives. So we have to, to, to be uh, very good communicators. We have to be to, 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 to speak better than we did in the past about these topics. Uh, I think it's a very good idea to to use the 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 um, transports, uh, the daily uh, tools that people use to move or to 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 work, and uh, also uh, we have to 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 take. Uh, uh, on your side, our very strong responsibilities, not only in terms of uh, uh, financial investments, I, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, thing too, but also in terms of uh, a, di a different narrative about Europe, about the importance of uh, um, Europe-based uh, uh, knowledge and uh, European society-based knowledge. Io vorrei chiedere per favore ai tre ragazzi, il mio inglese è pessimo, quindi se mi traducete, eh, quali sono state le loro difficoltà, ecco, eh, se hanno avuto dei momenti in cui pur giovani così, insomma, si sono chiesti come faccio ad andare avanti, perché c'era qualcosa che non funzionava nel loro percorso di ricerca. Um, I, I fail all the time, um, but I think scientists are good at failing. 
And it's that's something in the process of science that many other sectors of society can learn about. Why do we insist that our politicians never fail? They should fail all the time. They should fail every day because they have lots of good ideas and lots of bad ideas, but at least they try. And I'd rather live in a society that fails the whole time. Um, so learning to cope with that failure is a huge part of science. Um, and it's, it's something that as I, as, I, as I grow older in my career, Perhaps I'm learning to accept it more. It's, it's still disappointing. <laughs> but it's, I think that, 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 that struggle, whether it's funding or whether it's maybe a partnership with a colleague that doesn't work out or something, or grant application, these things are, uh, these are, are barriers, but you shouldn't let them beat you. Yeah, I'd actually agree. So one of the key characteristics of uh, successful researchers is, researchers is perhaps resilience and perseverance. And just being able to, to see your goal and stick with it. So whenever you come to a point where you question yourself or maybe question your potential for success, that's when you need uh, a good mentor who can remind you of what you've achieved so far in your career and where you're going next. And keeping that focus and that direction and that drive really helps you to just shake off your back any of the obstacles that, that come towards you and uh, keep going towards uh, the future success. All right, and um, I completely share the sentiments um, of Sarah's and, and Shane's, and I'd, I'd just like to add also that as an outsider, as a Canadian coming into the European society, um, starting off as a young researcher, PhD, and coming into a new, um, you know, Danish society, not knowing the language, the culture, the work ethics, um, it was slightly um, daunting at first, but I think the support of my supervisors, my peer, um, and just an open mind um, really helped to sort of um, overcome the social aspects as well, and that obviously had a repercussion on, on my work um, uh, and research um, there as well. And of course, scientifically, as, as Shane said, you know, failure is part of, uh, of our life as scientists. And if we don't have failures, if there's no obstacles, there's no interesting um, work, there's no um, sort of motivation to, to go on and, and ask more questions and, and do more science. So. One question here. Uh, the question is uh, to Mrs. Ba Trang. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. Uh, Aria, Aria Marie. Uh, the question is, uh, we are in a period where a few Italian researchers, for example, they, they go abroad to study. And so as I, uh, if I understood, Ah, so then the question is, I don't know, I don't remember the name of the Canadian. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, your motivation to decide to move from Canada and come to Europe and how you found uh, the, the life in Europe and, and such kind of, of activities that I think are, are important to have. Right, so it's an interesting question, and I, I touched upon it just a couple of minutes ago as well. Um, so why I moved to, to Europe, to Denmark in particular, um, at the time when I started my PhD, um, so my background is molecular biology, I'm a wet lab person mainly, but uh, growing up as a child, I was always fascinated by, you know, Egyptology and sort of, you know, the, the sort of... Uh, popular kind of um, archaeological sort of um, questions. Um, and at that time, there were no sort of um, multidisciplinary um, opportunities back there. Uh, currently there are, but when I started as a young researcher, there weren't. Um, and there were very few places um, doing good science that melded together these um, sort of diff two or three different um, fields and uh, offered sort of, um, you know, the, the resources to answer questions that had a bearing um, on archaeological questions, but the use of genetics and molecular biology. Um, and initially I moved to, to England to do my master's um, as Oxford was one of those places. Um, and that's where I heard about the Marie Curie um, actions and then I got in touch with the, the Danish um, researchers who were, who then you know, went on to become my supervisors. Um, and they're one of the top sort of two or three labs in the world currently doing the kind of work that they do because it's, it's sort of a very um, uh, high maintenance research work, the kind of work we do because we're dealing with humans, but who lived sort of thousands of years ago. So we're dealing with a lot of sensitive issues, uh, particularly in terms of contamination. Um, and it needs a lot of sterile sort of environment. It needs a high maintenance research facility, uh, which very few labs are able to, to offer. And Europe is one of the places um, with, with the funding in place that is able to um, offer these, um, these resources. And that really attracted me to, to come to Europe and 
Denmark in particular. Um, and it's, it's been quite a smooth transition and I think I need to thank again my supervisors and my peer for allowing me to settle down quite well and focus on the science rather than have to deal with so language issues and so on and so forth. Um, but also I came with an open mind. Um, I wanted to sort of uh, be part of the Danish society, be part of the European society. Um, and after about eight years now in Europe, um, I really feel like um, I've both contributed to the European society, but at the same time, um, I've also received a lot uh, from the society. Of course, funding and thanks to the European uh, Commission for that. But, but a lot of um, other, you know, have made friends for life, um, research collaborations for life, and so on and so forth. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, it has been mentioned uh, in the session before about personalized uh, PhD program. And I have to admit that it's really necessary to, to move this direction. However, I don't see yet how it could be organized and I'm very happy to hear it, but I would like to uh, also know how, what is your perspective uh, and how you are going to organize it. Because there are so many different programs, so it's very hard to handle it. And um, I think it's, it, it's a really great move, but what, what do you think about it? Okay, so um, I guess one of the, I think one of the biggest challenges actually at the moment for the European Commission and for the local funding agencies in each individual country is how we unify the, the level of training across the different disciplines and also across the different funding agencies. So um, one example is the, the program that I'm a training coordinator for. Um, that's the, the Cancer Imaging Centre, which is part funded by Cancer Research UK, a big cancer charity in Britain, and also by um, the EPSRC, which is our local physical sciences research council. And those two different um, research funding bodies have very different ideas of what they consider good scientific training for a PhD candidate. And probably what I consider good scientific training also differs from those. Um, but what we find in that program is that um, the way we do our interactive um, training and um, personalize it to the different students is really determined by myself and the other hierarchy as a coordinator and not by a, an agreed set of guidelines that we can work towards within, say, the European Commission or, or even just within the UK. So one big challenge is going to be to have some expectations of what PhD training is going to mean in 5, 10 or 15 years from now when a, a company or a university goes to recruit a PhD researcher. What, what, what are they getting? You know, what standardized set of skills did that person receive? Not just going to the lab, working for three or four years, um, producing some papers and then leaving. What transferable skills did they receive? What experiences did they get in industry, internships? Uh, you know, a big challenge in those things is finding funding for short stays in internships and industries. One of my students would really love to go and work for a company for a short period, but you know, I don't have the research funding to pay, pay them for that necessarily, and the companies don't always want to pay the host costs, so it's always a, a challenging battle between the two. So I guess in summary, I think it's a challenge of uh, unifying training, and I think there's definitely a question across the EC about um, what sort of guidelines we can prepare so that different people who are training candidates across um, the union can actually come up with a central set of, of training parameters. And I, I would add that it's important that we know what the expectations are of our scientists at all levels. It's something I did whilst I worked in a peer, at Imperial in, in London, where we tried to assess the um, the career aspirations of postdoctoral uh, staff members and PhD students, and we matched them them uh, with the um, career realities of where people had gone. And I found that this had not been done, and there's a huge amount of, of, of disparate uh, data from, from different member states and some data from the Commission, but I think it would be important if we could try and tie that together so that it could inform um, how these, uh, uh, th these things go forward. Nobody wants to know why the Eiffel Tower is shorter in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> then I believe our Director General Xavier Pratsmonet would like to say a word too. Oh, just I can tell you very, very brief words. I just wanted to say, just to highlight how extraordinarily proud the European Commission and this particular civil servant 
is to be able to support even modestly this kind of talent and to make it as visible, as well-known, as scaled up as possible. This is really, really possible, the best example I can think of, of what the European Commission can do for Europe in a very tangible and simple way. So I hope that we can continue this and I hope there will be even more at the service of these type of ideas. And on the last question, I think this is a very good illustration. What we just heard about these young people is the sort of things that are actually pretty much common sense about uh, how we should get the expectations of PhDs and postdoc students closer to what they actually get. This is so common sense and actually is not happening. And this is what should make us think of maybe giving a better voice to learners in the way we reform education and to make sure that what uh, people who are actually in the process of learning and we have to face a very difficult future, certainly not a very good future without a knowledge society, how can you make sure that these voices are better heard and transferred into policy? So it's not a Brussels bureaucrat or administration trying to organize teaching, but try to make sure that the expectations of learners are actually met and that we focus on outcomes as opposed to uh, uh, degrees. This is really the challenge that we have to meet. So thank you. That was my last word. <laughs>